All right. Um, I want to call to order the April 14, 2021 uh, regular meeting. This is our workshop. We're here at the municipal, uh, Murfreesboro Municipal Airport. If you will, if you'll bow your heads with me, we'll say uh, the pledge of allegiance. Uh, Father, thank you for this chance that we get to be together. Um, Lord, that we get to come and make decisions prayerfully that are in the best of our community. Uh, I pray that you give us guidance. That you give us us the ability to see things uh, and be level-headed, uh, void of emotion. Uh, Lord, I thank you for our staff, for, our, for all of our employees and the people who protect us in our community every single day. Uh, we ask all these things in your name. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God. Indivisible, with liberty and justice, justice for all. Yeah, I think you have someone you want to introduce, don't you? Yes, Mayor and members of the City Council, I'd like to introduce uh, Ryan Halsey. He's the new airport manager. Uh, yesterday was his first day, or Tuesday was his first day. So today is his third day, so this is the charm. And uh, see if you'll stay with us. <laughs> So uh, right. you'll see him around, and uh, he'll be joining us at other city council meetings and other events around town. All right. Um, we are still operating, I believe the executive order is number 54, where we can conduct hearings virtually. I think uh, Vice Mayor Scales Harris, Madeline, are you there? Yes, I am, but I can barely hear you, Mayor. Okay. Let me clear off. You too. Uh, Bottom, bottom middle. Okay, Madeline, can you hear now? Better? Very good. Very good. Okay, great. If y'all make sure lights on your microphone, that'd be great. All right, uh, we'll move into, we have several items uh, to work through. Uh, we have action items. We have a five-year consolidated plan, and this is with community development. Hey, just one second, Mayor. We're having a little technical difficulty there, but we're going to work through it here. I think Ronnie's got the remote control over there, and he's just messing with <laughs> Brian, if you would, on that white panel, no, the other one, the other white one. Yep, there we go. Remote control's now with your phone. Your kids are watching TV, and you're like, stop. The other remote. Thank you, Chad. Uh, good morning, Mayor, mem Mayor's member and council. We have uh, an action item, a uh, short presentation followed by an action item on a, a community development item. I do want to introduce uh, a couple of our community development staff. Um, Helen Glenn is our assistant director, and then Jafar Ware um, is our uh, planner and grants administrator. They've done most of the heavy lifting on this presentation that uh, I'll be able to make. Um, so. We started this process over a year ago. Uh, this process should normally take about 45 days um, uh, from the time it's originally advertised to uh, the time we have an approved plan, but because of uh, COVID, we hit the pause button in March, and we're now resuming this action. And the action I'm asking you to take today actually uh, will be partly to look back over the last year um, because we continue to operate uh, with HUD's approval under um, interim conditions. And so this plan will look back one year, but it'll also look forward uh, four years. Uh, the city has been a recipient of community development funds since uh, 1984. Uh, that funding comes from HUD. Um, the five-year plan and the annual action plan uh, are required to identify community needs and then how to address those needs using the funding provided from HUD. Um, this document would serve from 2020 through 2025. It would address the community development block grant, uh, which is uh, uh, given to us every year, as well as the emergency solutions grant, uh, which comes from the state of Tennessee, um, but it's also there to help provide uh, services in our community. The consolidated plan will address those five areas um, based on uh, the priorities that we've identified for our community. And we must also include community participation, monitoring uh, the process, the partnerships we force, forge, and then uh, information on lead-based paint where it involves housing. Um, we're required to certify that we have uh, citizen participation, 
uh, anti-displacement relocation, and a current analysis of impediments to uh, fair housing. All three of these documents are available at the city's website and at our community development office. Um, it is the city's policy to affirmatively further fair housing. Uh, to that end, we engage in activities that promote and educate regarding fair housing. And we also are a, uh, a complaint uh, management organization when fair housing complaints come in to our fair housing officer, uh, Ms. Glenn. She takes, uh, takes care of those and gives direction and refers for additional action where it's appropriate. Um, we, have one of, we must meet one of these three um, objectives in our plan, a low and moderate income benefit, uh, preventing or eliminating slums or blights, and then also meeting urgent needs. Uh, in, in Murfreesboro, the CBDG funds um, assist low and moderate income residents uh, in a geographic area or with programs that specifically target people who are in the moderate income or low income areas. Uh, those numbers come to us from the analysis of the Nashville area data. It's also defined based on size. Here's a, uh, a chart just to give you an idea of what some of those numbers look like for our community uh, versus the n number of persons in the household. Uh, this Again, this data is, is given to us uh, to help define for our community the uh, low, extremely low, and uh, moderate income individuals and, and families. So regarding the five-year consolidated plan and looking at that, uh, we have a, uh, a federal allocation uh, this program year of, of that number. That is an in increase from the year before. Uh, the funding is based on uh, data and formula, uh, formulas developed by HUD, and this number has been fairly consistent at this level going up uh, a, a few thousand dollars every year for the last several years. Uh, so with that new allocation plus some of our program income and carryover, we're really looking to program about $1.7 million. And again, this is for this current year. It's actually looking back almost a year. And then we receive annually $161,000 uh, uh, for emergency solutions grant funding through THDA. Um, we published a draft consolidation plan um, consolidated plan on March the 11th that was made available to the public uh, that we're reviewing today that, that that actual plan and we'll be asking for your approval of that plan in just a few moments. Did re, we did conduct a public hearing and we received some public comment. We've uh, met with stakeholders over the past uh, year or so and then re-engaged with those stakeholders in the last few weeks just to uh, move this forward. We, this is a summary of the types of public comments we received and that public comment period ended on April the 9th. Uh, our plan will address what needed specific responses to these, to these areas. Many of these were uh, areas we responded to the um, commenter um, in the meeting or as a follow-up just to give them some additional information on that. But then uh, these public comments serve to also shape and direct our program. Um, now we're looking at the first year action plan. And so for this first year, which again is the, the year we're currently in, um, we have focused on these program items, uh, single family uh, home rehab, first time home buyer assistance, public service grants, which are grants that are giving, given to strategic partners uh, to help implement programs important to us. Uh, we have, um, and I'll cover this in a minute, but we have uh, 13 uh, grant applicants, 12 of those we funded a previous year, 12 we intend to fund this year. Um, we've funded acquisitions, public facilities, and then we've also uh, used the grant funding to cover our administrative expenses, including uh, labor and materials and uh, office expenses. Uh, so for the first year action plan, uh, we've proposed $100,000 for rehab. We have uh, estimated $50,000 in program income to give us a total of $150 for this category. Uh, affordable home house, home housing program, first time home buyer assistance. Again, we've proposed $100,000. 
uh, with estimated uh, program income of 50000 and program income is money that comes into the Community Development Department through the repayment of grants and loans as a condition of, of um, awarding those several years ago. Um, and so we get, we get program income coming into the department uh, on an annual basis. Uh, we've worked primarily with Habitat for Humanity, uh, Humanity this year uh, in, in getting first-time home buyers into homes by providing that down payment assistance to 10, to 10 homes. Public service grants, we received 13 applicants. We have uh, uh, verified 12 of those. Uh, and that funding is uh, limited uh, in the HUD program to 15% of our annual allocations plus 15% of program income. And that's why we have this um, uh, number of 158,000 rather than a, a nice rounder number. Um, and so the program public service grants will again be used to fund partners who help implement programs in our community, the Boys and Girls Club, Doors of Hope, uh, Hope Clinic, uh, Salvation Army, and others uh, that, that provide services to our target demographic. Uh, we propose uh, $49,931 to acquisition. That was really just a cleanup of the uh, digits in the, in the actual <coughs> budget for us, plus uh, carryover funding. So we estimate we have about $410,000 for acquisition. We've already uh, uh, worked with three, uh, two partners to purchase three properties that will be placed in the um, low-income program for the next 10 years. And then public facilities, those are city-owned facilities or government-owned facilities that are not used for general government operations. We Care Daycare is an example of that. Our park facilities can be examples of that. Our public infrastructure, such as roads and drainage and water and sewer, are examples of uh, uh, services that are pro provided through public facilities. And we can uh, fund improvements uh, to those systems and to, to those public facilities and have. And so we propose approximately 150000 for this program year. Um, our administrative budget is capped at 20% uh, of our annual allocation, and it includes uh, $2,000 for um, fair housing activity, which is training, education, and awareness program that we use to train our staff and our service providers and others in the housing industry in our community. <coughs> And there's a description of um, we, we, we were not able to, to um, sponsor that Housing Matters Conference, but we, we have conducted a uh, legal seminar and we'll conduct another legal seminar uh, later this year uh, for our staff and others interested. And so let's, uh, any questions or comments? I know I uh, went through this pretty quickly. It's a 127-page document. We did provide you all a link as well as a uh, summary Take the summary in our uh, in our uh, staff agenda. I have a question. Is it on the carryover? Is there expiration? If we don't spend it, we we'll lose it, or is it? Can we? No. How long can we? Yeah, the carryover is is from. Uh, it it actually continues to work. What we have to do though is we have to show HUD that we're. Um, putting the money to work. And so when, when they see large carryover balances, um, they come back and, and, and ask you what your plans are for those monies. We just need to demonstrate for that carryover funding that we have a plan for it. Uh, in years past, we would uh, manage carryover for public facilities by taking allocations for three or four years to do a public infrastructure project. Um, and so this year is a little bit unusual for us to have that much carryover just because we simply weren't able to get the program funds out because so many things were, were paused or on hold. Uh, and we're looking to, to aggressively get those funds back out. Um, and another thing I'll mention uh, to the group is we've also been notified of about $1.4 million of COVID funding that's available to our program that we'll be programming and spending in the next uh, uh, several months under COVID relief uh, part of the package. We do track that money by fiscal year that it's given, so we try to spend the old money first. If it's a, if it's an active project, the older money gets spent before the newer money in that project. I just wanted to make sure it didn't go away. <laughs> some, of those federal, out. some of those funds, you know, have a, a time. Yeah. And, and Ms. Wright and, and her team are, are great partners for us. They help us track that and, and make sure we're, uh, we're we're counting our pennies and then also make sure we're, we're following the rules on which money is to be spent. So they do a great job there. Thanks for that explanation. Any other questions or comments? 
Mr. Sam, will you talk about how the public meeting went that we held at Parison Park? Talk about that a little bit. Yes, sir. We had, uh, we had some uh, stakeholders present, and, and they were primarily stakeholders. Uh, I think we, we had one or two people that, that were interested in the program that, that you might conclude represented the, the public, um, and then we, uh, we provided information on this and reviewed this, uh, this almost the same presentation with that group. Uh, I don't remember the exact count, but I think probably counting staff, there was about uh, 10 uh, uh, folks who participated in that. It was at Patterson Park. This was the, s the second public hearing we, we conducted on this um, because we also conducted a public hearing about a year ago to start the process. So again, a 45-day process normally. We stretched it out over a year and a month. Um, and that's very unusual for us. This We should have already been beyond that. but. But HUD extended uh, grace to a lot of programs just because they knew the operations were not there. Uh, Mr. Martin, I'm not sure if I answered your question on that, if there's any other uh, thoughts you had. Uh, specific. And so, um, uh, Ms. Glenn and uh, Mr. Ware with our department also reached out individually to some of our participants and stakeholders to, uh, to engage them specifically. And if we back up and look at the consolidated plan, we put, published a survey, online survey. Um, Austin Cooper uh, Planning Department helped us with that about a year ago, maybe even 15 months ago. That was available online. I think we had uh, 368 responses to that survey that helped us understand uh, their perception of the needs of our community as it relates to, to the HUD funding. So we think we've had a very successful public engagement program this year, even with the protracted schedule. Cover a couple other business items then with this. Uh, so the action plan um, was also published, and that public comment period was open, and that action plan is available um, for response and comment and also for review, and that, that has been published as well in accordance with the uh, public program. And then those uh, plans are available as well at a couple of locations, including our office, uh, Lime Ball Library, and then Patterson Park at the uh, ML, uh, MG Lord uh, Library, Branch Library there. Any other questions or comments on either the action plan or the consolidate, five-year consolidated plan? And so the five-year consolidated plan will be our roadmap again, for the past year and then for the next four years. The action plan is actually somewhat looking backwards this time. We'll be back in front of you in a few weeks with the second year action plan, which will address how we, how we plan to utilize the funds for the, for the second program year um, and as well as the, uh, the, the COVID <coughs> funding that's, that's available to us. No other questions on the presentation. Uh, we'd ask that you uh, approve this plan and the first year action plan and then allow us to make our submittals to HUD uh, to get the funding available uh, to, our, to our community. Move approved. Second. Motion is second. Ms. Wright, please call the roll. Vice Mayor Skills Harris. Aye. Mr. LaLance. Aye. Mr. Martin. Aye. Mr. Shacklett. Aye. Mr. Wade. Aye. Mr. Wright. Aye. Mary McFarland. Aye. Uh, we now have the sale of a remnant parcel. Yeah, Mayor, this is a, a small parcel that's located actually uh, right behind uh, Maple Street Clinic on Vine Street, 652 square feet. Um, originally bought to put uh, infrastructure in, uh, electrical infrastructure, and decided it, that wasn't a good location for it. Uh, the adjoining landowner, um, um, Mr. Lowry, is interested in buying that. Um, and so uh, the proposal is to sell that to him for 30500 I think it is. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer, or, or uh, Mr. Whitaker can have more specific details. I'm going to abstain from discussion and vote on this matter. <clears throat> Questions, I move for approval. Motion? Second. Motion is second. Ms. Wright, any discussion? Ms. Wright, please call the room. Vice Mayor Skills Harris. Aye. 
Mr. Lalance. Abstain. Mr. Martin. Aye. Mr. Shacklett. Aye. Mr. Wade. Aye. Mr. Wright. Aye. Mayor McClellan. Aye. All right, we'll move to the bond premium proceeds. Good Aaron. morning. Hi. Uh, we received close to a $6 million cash premium with the February bond issue. And in our one on one discussions that uh, we had last week, I mentioned there were a few items uh, identified during the budget review that could be funded with the bond premium. And these items are related to street, golf, and recreation equipment, and they would have otherwise qualified for bond proceeds if we had included that in the original CIP. So those are all listed on that supplemental uh, sheet along with the uh, council communication. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Any questions for Ms. Tucker? Second. Motion and second. Vice Mayor Skills Harris. Aye. Mr. Lalance. Aye. Mr. Martin. Aye. Mr. Shacklett. Aye. Mr. Wade. Aye. Mr. Wright. Aye. Mayor McFarland. Aye. All right, we'll move to the minute agreement for landscape buffer and easement along the south side of Wilkinson Pike. The Mayor Council stand before you this afternoon uh, asking approval for a revised agreement uh, for landscape buffer easement. Uh, to accommodate sanitary sewer structures along the south side of Wilkerson Pike, water and sewer, uh, landing legal and planning of all reviewed. Uh, everything is in order. Available for any questions. Is this the vote for being put in by Tommy Smith? Yes, sir. All right. So moved. Second. That's right. Please call the roll. Vice Mayor Skills Harris. Aye. Mr. Lalance. Aye. Mr. Martin. Aye. Mr. Shacklett. Aye. Mr. Way. Aye. Mr. Wright. Aye. Mayor McFarland. Aye. All right. We'll now move to our workshop items, and you've got the econ economic development marketing plan. Craig. Yeah. Uh, this is a reintroduction of a topic that we've talked about in the past. Uh, we were uh, slowed down last year with uh, the the. Um, Situation at the uh, uh, concerning the pandemic. Um, we'll give it to Jim. Okay. Down there. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that's okay. Uh, so we'll uh, right now. You know, we've we've continued to work with the chamber, and, and um, as we have in the past, and chamber's taken the uh, point contact with the state and other economic development agencies. But the city's at a point now. We believe that we can do a lot more self-directed activity, uh, and so uh, we've developed a plan. With the assistance of uh, our consultant Jim Coulson um, to look forward into the future and really the intent today is to introduce uh, a plan that we intend to be uh, over the next few years dynamic depending on the market conditions and certain decisions the council makes as we go forward um, but uh, with the introduction today I think it's a good topic also to take up on our uh, retreat coming up here in May uh, we can have a lot more further discussions to give the council a chance to think about the uh, uh, the marketing plan and, and how they want to go forward. But uh, if you have any questions, of course, Jim's here to, to answer, and I'll just turn it over to, to Jim Coulson, who not only has been instrumental in the plan, but as we've gone through economic development projects over the last year, the ones that have come in, he's, he's helped us out with that. And uh, as we amend our land use map, uh, which is important to economic development as well, uh, he's he's uh, spoken with uh, Greg and had some input into that, so that's been very helpful. So uh, there's been some activity on, and, and uh, we haven't had a chance to come back to council, so I want to take that opportunity today. So, Jim, take it away. Great. Thank you, Mr. Tyndall, Mayor Council. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Um, from a rolling out perspective, I think we have to start with the obvious is that this body has demonstrated leadership uh, over the past uh, couple of years, uh, certainly not limiting it to that. Um, but the key thing here is that you have addressed many vital issues that impact the city from a, a physical uh, perspective, operational and certainly from a financial perspective. The result is that the city is in a position that it's probably never been before in its capacity to compete for economic development um, projects. The investments have, that have been made support the abilities to growth 
And I think it's important to state that in a manner that's consistent with what your desires are. A more diverse mixture of, of companies, specifically those that are driving higher wages, uh, have uh, skill sets that, that possibly match uh, both the desirable uh, intent of the community, but also uh, match the skill sets that exist within the community, uh, and to make sure that the economic devel development program ties into the infrastructure capacity that exists within the community and does not impact it in a, in a negative way. Simply put, the city is ready to compete. The, the question is, what level is that going to be? And that's precisely and entirely up to you as a body. The key focus here would be targeting industries, generating leads and prospects, developing a marketing outreach program which consists both of the website, social media, and actually directly engaging uh, with those who influence projects and the projects themselves, but also establishing a communication program that is focused on measuring your success. Are we doing what we intended to do? Are we getting the type of return that we anticipated getting? And are we reporting that in such a way that it deals with the issues of transparency and trust that are critical within uh, the uh, governance today and leadership today? And then also that you build a feedback loop so that as you're going forward, you might recognize that you need to make certain adjustments to the program uh, to continue to push the program forward and have much more success. The uh, last point on this slide is it really is simply a matter of aligning. Aligning the actions that this body takes and this community takes to the desires that this community has. There's been a lot of conversation that I've heard over the last couple of years uh, that are voicing concerns about the current economic development model and not to make any disparaging comments by anybody because there aren't disparaging comments to make. Uh, but there's more opportunity out there. There's an opportunity to, uh, to target specific companies and types of companies that are more in line with the voiced uh, desires of the community. There's also an opportunity to be more engaged in the process at a deeper level and at an earlier level so that you can influence projects um, as they come forward uh, and, and be uh, fully prepared and fully ready uh, to address these issues. Uh, there, there, there is not only one correct way to do good economic development. It can be done in a variety of manners, and that's certainly the case here. We're going to outline three alternative approaches, and there could be five uh, based on how far you want to go and how much you want to uh, invest in the program going forward. Some of the existing assets, and I know we've talked about these things before, I just want to, to make a finer point on a couple of these points. From a labor force perspective, which is the number one issue that impacts economic development projects um, anywhere, Murfreesboro has a phenomenal story to tell. Uh, there, and, and these are numbers that I'm sure you're familiar with, but the number that I want to draw your attention to is the third major bullet point under the labor. There are 78,515 people who leave Rutherford County every day to go to work. 40,000, 40,600 of them are going to Davidson County and 12,074 are going to Williamson County. That, those numbers, just in terms of the raw numbers of, of people that are available in this workforce is a great story. When you add to that story that there's currently 78,000 people who are leaving here and going somewhere else to work, that we can only assume that if jobs were available within Murfreesboro that were of the quality for those individual people and what they do for a living, they'd probably rather stay home and work 
and not deal with the commute, which as everybody knows, uh, can be somewhat arduous and challenging here. So the labor story that can be told pertaining to, to Murfreesboro and Rutherford County is very positive. From a real estate perspective, we've looked at several sites. We've provided within the report a breakdown of ready-to-go sites and sites that are potentially uh, developable and, and have value. So we know that we have good sites here. I think the better story to tell is those sites can be delivered, high-quality sites can be delivered at a significant cost benefit to other sites that would be available within the region, specifically uh, in uh, Davidson and in Williamson County, Franklin, and, and Nashville. The story that we can tell is that you can have a great site, you can have great labor, and you can cut your cost substantially by locating here. Uh, the outward pressure that exists within the the Nashville market, as it's rising prices, it's, it's pushing people further and further away. And not that I've taken a tremendously close look at it, but I've, I've looked at it, is what's happening in Gallatin is pretty impressive. And they're doing what, what we say that we should do. They're aggressively going out there, and they're telling their own story, and they're starting to win more and more projects going forward. So uh, we can do the same thing. It's time to tell a new story. We have to replace the old story, which is we're a good place for manufacturing and we're a good place for warehousing distribution and logistics. The story is we're a great place if you have an office need, if you have advanced technology, if you have medical, you should be here. The people that are influencing these projects, particularly in this region, are not thinking about us when it comes to that sort of activity. So we need to be aggressively out there and we need to be telling this particular story. The three models that exist, one is to maintain the current model, the second is to create a city economic development office, I'll sometimes refer to it as an EDO, um, and then the third is to establish some type of, of hybrid approach. They all can work to varying degrees. They each have pros and they each have cons. That is laid out in the report that's been provided to you, and I think there will be an opportunity for a lot of conversation about that. If we stay with the current model, I think that would entail having more in-depth conversations about what the expectations of the city are. The benefits of staying with the current model is it is a long-term relationship. They do have established relationships with the people who, who influence the uh, decisions that happen within this region. They do have good programs from a research perspective, and they're certainly uh, very good when it comes to dealing with workforce uh, and development issues. Uh, regionalism, regionalism is important. You have to recognize that Murfreesboro doesn't stand alone just like no community stands alone. They have to be part of the regional effort. The site locator and the companies rarely know where the boundary lines is between cities, but they do understand the benefits of, region, of regions. But as said, the current model, while it's working, to some degree it's not working to the total degree. And, and the concerns that are continually being expressed are so consistent and so continuing that one has to recognize that something has to be done to address it. Could it be done by staying with the current model? Possibly. Um, that's up to you to decide. The second approach is to create a city EDO. Uh, that is going in whole hog. Uh, it, it means uh, hiring a staff becoming responsible for your own research, become responsible for your own marketing and outreach, um, be actively involved in project generation, uh, prospect generation and project management. Uh, it, it, it means to become actively the person who, or the person or the staff that is doing the direct uh, engagement with the, with the people. And while it's certainly not starting from zero, it's starting from a very small number uh, that you have to go forward and there, are, there, there is time and cost associated with this. The approach that, that, that 
I would recommend going forward is a hybrid approach where you combine the best of both worlds, where you sit down with the chamber and you identify things that they do that are very good and very important to you and you continue to do that and you maintain your contractual relationship to do those things, uh, but you also identify the things that are important to you uh, that you want to do. And I would say what would fall in that category would be to uh, take a look at the specific target industries that are of interest to this community and a marketing program structured precisely uh, to go after that and to be directly involved in, in working with the projects and the influencers uh, associated with that. Uh, and, and a lot of that information is outlined in the um, report going forward. The objectives, and I'll keep this at a very high level, are threefold. Number one is you want to attract new industries. You want to attract those that diversify the economy, that hit the targets that you're interested, primarily high wages and um, advanced, ad, advanced technology and office types of projects. I think uh, if, if we were to get two or three office projects in the next couple of years, I think people would consider that a pretty good win and a, and a, and a nice start on a legacy. Uh, the second thing, and this is often talked about but rarely done well, uh, is, is supporting the existing business community. Uh, really engaging the business community so that you can meet with them, you can help, you can get them to a point where they can tell you specifically what they need and what would be good, and then start putting together a, a program that is designed specifically to support the existing industries. Why? Because we want them to thrive. As they thrive, they grow, they create jobs, they pay higher wages, they, they win internal business, and they grow our economy from that way. And then uh, I think also they provide a great source of identifying what's happening in their industry uh, and who would be of interest uh, to recruit coming, coming here. So it's a, a, a cycle that can uh, benefit uh, both parties. And the third is implement a technology accelerator. Now that is a very vague term. What we're talking about there is becoming engaged and looking at an incubator, uh, looking at a tech corridor, looking at how to support entrepreneurship activities. Uh, and I think that that is an area that is vital in the specific marketing plan. We talk about steps that you can take in addressing that. And then just to give people a feel for what we're talking about on a relative scale, um, this is based on sample budgets that I looked from, from other organizations and activities that would be involved in this, but you know, you're, if you go the current model, uh, that fifty thousand dollars for half a person, um, and that probably is money that's already being spent somewhere within the organization, or it could be um, another approach to bringing somebody in to address some of these issues. It has a minor uh, look at establishing a little bit more of a web presence and a little bit more of a social media presence and specific research that is of interest to the city. And then becoming more actively engaged in industry associations such as uh, the International Economic Development Council, uh, site, site Selectors Guild, maybe join the food, you know, one of the industry groups that are associated in one of the groups that uh, you want to attract. The city EDO, uh, all of those things are saying more money, two to three people looking at a budget of $315,000 and the hybrid uh, is, is looking at one to one and a half people, probably one person uh, to start out and then, and then as you ramp up the program. Um, but the primary focus here is making sure that you are telling your story and that you have somebody who can aggressively build the relationships um, going forward. Jim, can I stop you just yes. get a clarification for us? As I read through this, I, there was a little bit of confusion in my mind, but I just want to make sure I'm square. The difference between the middle column and the far right column that develop the EDO and the hybrid, the hybrid we are still going to have an EDO, an economic development office. We're just going to, we're going to, do a little less of something and re rely on the chamber a little more or our other partners to do more 
And in the middle section, are we saying we're just all in, all on our own? What, what, what? Tell me, tell us the difference between the, the far two columns there. Uh, Rick, thank you. I think that's a, a great clarifying question. I, I would say that in the middle column, the city EDO, you have a standalone department with a director, and 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 you're building all of the assets and the and the programming necessary to take on the entirety of the economic development program. It doesn't necessarily mean that the chamber goes away. They're still going to be there. Yeah, that's they're, kind they're of my still point. they're still going to do things. They they represent the entire county, and certainly we're still part of the county, uh, but. But we would not depend on them for um, all the lead generation. Would they send us leads still? Probably, because we've got some assets that they need to take advantage of. But we would really be going into that to uh, to build our own program, which is very common. I mean, it, it, this model is is all over the place. We're a, we're a good sized city. We're the sixth largest city in Tennessee. Um, we've got a budget that uh, would make it normal for us to have this type of thing, and certainly the maturity and the capacity that we that we have here. The hybrid approach, really, I would see that at least for the first year or so, working out of the city manager's office, that, that this person who is conducting the, uh, prosecuting the economic development mission really is a direct report to the city manager and is carrying forth uh, the program out of his office as opposed to a standalone. The specific activities would be um, making sure the website and the social media program are operating, uh, maybe using some additional assets within the organization uh, to accomplish that. Uh, secondly, to making sure that we really understand the target industries and how to uh, go after those. How do you talk to somebody you know, who's, who's making a selection on a regional office project? Where do they hang out? What do they eat? What are, what's important to them? And, and figure out a way to get into the communication pattern with them and then I think most importantly is become very active continually meeting with the real estate professionals meeting with the development community meeting with the site locators becoming act actively involved in the industry associations uh, the specific company like manufacturing or NAOP or uh, office products um, properties so that person is go 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 but really is not quite a full office operating out of the city manager. Do you know which model Gallison uses? Uh, they have a, they have a uh, they have a full a full office. Okay. Um, they're actually now they they probably operate out of their chamber. I would I would I've only been looking at Gallatin from the results, and I had an opportunity to meet the director. Um, so. I, I can't really say. Um, and I, and I want to be really clear here, uh, just in case this becomes a national story. Um, I really truly believe in regionalism, and I preach regionalism all the time. But at the same time, I preach success. If you, 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 have, to, you have to take the necessary steps to get the goals that you, that you want to. You have to put the actions forward that allow you to, to do that. And I think right now there is a lot of benefit that comes from the relationship that the city has with the chamber, but it's not the full benefit. It's it's not it's not allowing you to achieve certain things that are very important to you, specifically the types of companies that are coming and the the communication protocols that exist. It seems to not be enough. And it doesn't seem to be timely. And those, those put, in this case, the city manager's office and you in a very awkward position because you're going to get asked questions about incentives and interest levels uh, and willingness to to host a particular company on a on a site, a city-owned site, that you really just haven't had enough time to evaluate and process it. Can I ask one more question? Sure. Uh, your people commuting out of the county, do you know what the mix of private sector and public sector is of that 78,000 people? I don't, I don't have that. Okay. 
Jim, my understanding is um, 80 to 85 percent of the economic development opportunities come to the chamber through the state of Tennessee. Is that correct? I don't know what their what their mix in in um, lead and prospect generation, but I I think that would be um, I think that would not be inconsistent with what happens in a lot of organizations. And I, I, anecdotally, I think that's probably about. That's probably about right, based on what we've seen. Looking at Gary and Sam back there, most things are coming through the state. Now, when I when we say the state, they work closely with TVA. So TVA has its right. own arm. So the TVA will bring in, and then uh, the Middle Tennessee Industrial Board. Um, I think they they get involved in, in bringing some in. So when they come in, they come in together. It's hard to say where it initiated from, but but those are where most of the the leads are. To the chamber. So part of the reason I asked the question, you know, a lot of what we've talked about is specific to the chamber about what we want more of or feel like we should get more of or whatever. How would us having our own EDO change the pass through of that, those opportunities coming from the state, or are we saying we're going to create opportunities that the state's not creating? Both. I think the, I would want to structure my prospect development program that I start measuring where my leads are coming from and if I'm not generating 45, 50, 60 percent of my own leads at some point, I'm probably going to um, have to take a look at, at my program. There's, there's, so uh, my, my primary role uh, from a career perspective has, has been to represent companies who are doing site location analysis. I will more often than not start with the region and go to that to that person. I, I will communicate with the state. Absolutely, I go to people that I know. Uh, obviously, I'm not going to take them a project that it doesn't fit, but if I'm doing a project in, in uh, say, Oklahoma, I know that I'm going to go to the Oklahoma. <clears throat> uh, City Chamber of Commerce and the Tulsa Chamber of Commerce because I know that's where all the things are going to be. But at the same time, I'm going to reach out to the state and, and, and say that. All of that to be said, this is a relational world. Um, it's, it's less so today because of the quality of the, of the data informatics that are out there and, and knowing what is being said about you in, on the, the, uh, in the data sources is absolutely vital. But I think that, that our, our objective would be to continue to receive whatever comes through the state, and even if it comes through the chamber, um, if they stop giving us those, we'd probably have an issue. And the state would have an issue too, because Murfreesboro is a pretty significant player within the county. But at the same time, we want to build our own lead generation, prospect development, project management uh, uh, mechanism to, to do that. And as I said, my target would probably be a 50-50 sort of thing. I think um, there are successful communities I can think of that probably are generating any of their real projects are coming from things that they've generated themselves. So, so as an example, for, for us, uh, 30 to 60,000 square foot class A office in medical center, it would be important for us to fill that up. The, the state's not going to pay attention to something like that. They're looking for much more, bigger fish than, than that. So, you know, if we had an EDO or even the hybrid approach, we'd be focusing on those kind of projects and looking for that. And then also at the same time taking in what we get from the state, the chamber. So, you know, it's a dual, it would be a dual approach, I think, that would be beneficial to the city our size. Yeah, and if I can follow up on that, I, we would certainly want to get to the point with the state and with the TVA that they recognize us as our own independent country, you know, that, that we, want, we want to be part of their, their distribution list when it comes to projects. We're, uh, this person uh, who fulfills the role, whether it's under the EDO or whether it's under the hybrid approach, that person can have wheels on his feet, her feet. Um, they are, they, building those relationships is, is, is absolutely critical. And, and just a little anecdotal thing, uh, sometime back in my career, I was, I was uh, invited to New Mexico to be the, the, the head of the state economic development program under Governor Richardson. And when I, when I went there, 
the first four months, <laughs> we're traveling and visiting all the site locators and explaining to them that, yeah, New Mexico is a state. You don't need a passport to get there. And by the way, we've got a lot of money, uh, and we can provide incentives, and we've got some good sites, and we've got good labor. And by the way, this is where um, Microsoft started, except for they wouldn't make Bill Gates a, a loan. <laughs> they wouldn't make him a little loan, so they went to this place in Washington. Did pretty good there. So... Uh, but it, it is a it is it is a relation building thing. But it's not just we're buds. You got to be able to deliver the goods. And I think the story that can be told about Murfreesboro is much better than what's being currently told today. This seems like the kind of the difference between waiting on seeing the leads come in and trying to go out and get some of the stuff on our you know going and chasing it. I mean, is that is that the hundred I mean, percent? Going after it rather than waiting and answering the phone for somebody to call. Hundred percent. It's the it's the difference of the of, of the, it isn't just the guy who's sitting in the car dealership, the salesman, and waiting for somebody to come on the lot. That person's actually waiting for the person to come on the lot and then the sales manager to decide whether you know whether you get to talk to the guy, as opposed to going out and calling people and looking for cars and you know being aggressive about this. A little bit more sophisticated than that, but. Uh, there, there are there are research-based data analytic tools that are out there that that really allow you to streamline your approach. It's it's highly technical. It takes a lot of work, um, uh, and there's a an ability to build a predictive model, which hopefully is going to match you your community with a with a company that would benefit from being there and and within this model you can identify companies within the industry that you like that are doing certain things they're experiencing certain growth rates they're experiencing certain labor amounts they're certain experiencing you know whatever sort of things they win a new project something's happening with that that company that you want to knock on their door and say hey looks like you might need a new facility have you ever heard of Murfreesboro this is why you should think about coming here. And I'm not saying you just walk in and smile. You walk in and you hand them a, you hand them a document. And that document creates a value proposition, which they say, wow, have you been you know, looking at our files and knowing what our problems are? We're, we're able to anticipate your needs. We're able to come forward uh, with, a, with a response that if the person's being honest and there's openness, they're going to they're gonna engage in a conversation. Do you win? Not always. In fact, most of the time you don't. But sometimes you do. 18 months or so ago, I was somewhere else visiting a client and uh, had noticed that that city had done a, what I thought was a really good job with, um, you know, this kind of well, bunch of these wins with a lot of tech companies and stuff like that. So I called the mayor's office and just asked if he'd spend 30 minutes with me after my meeting. And he was... Um, uh, nice enough to oblige me, but I would have. I didn't know kind of this layout right here. But you know, I, I meet him. I asked him. I said, "Look, I'm I'm here to I'm here to find out what the what the secret sauce is, so I can steal it and take some of it to Murfreesboro, Tennessee. I'm not I'm not hiding anything. I want you to tell me something that'll help us." And he, his what it sounded like he explained to me was very much kind of this hybrid approach. I, I wouldn't have known that's what to call it, but he told me that they have their own team within their city that does go after things, but they still work very closely with the chamber and it's a very successful, you know, it's a very successful uh, process that they use and everybody's happy and, you know, they just, they just, it, it sounded like exactly this, they're the ones going out and they're very specific to that particular city in their county. Um, but that, he told me even sometimes they would go after something and, and everybody would figure out that it might be better for a different, you know, a different municipality. And, and that was all fine, too, because they're all still working in concert very well, you know. Um, so anyway, I will tell you that that sounds like that approach to me, what he explained, because I really didn't kind of understand what he meant, because I was sort of expecting either you have your own person or you're working through the partners, you know, one or the other was going to be the answer, he told me. And he didn't say that. I was like, well, how's that work? So, but I think that's it. Um, so anyway, for what it's worth, I, I, 
I have had a little bit of experience talking with other municipalities where this has happened. I think I think obviously there's not there are probably not many communities that wouldn't want the types of things that we would want in Murfreesboro. I would say lots of people would like to have those to pull them from the tree if we could. Given that, um, our how prevalent is a hybrid system or an EDO in our community? And I guess second question is knowing you talked about how long it takes to how deeply rooted a lot of these relationships are that end up producing fruit of opportunity. How long would we expect it to take something to bear fruit with an investment of taxpayer dollars to try to bring economic opportunity here? Because my experience has been that's a pretty long sales cycle, but it may be different with what you do. Yeah, Ronnie, that's a, I mean, that's, that's a good point. I, so how long does it take to build the relationships? I think, I think a lot of them can be cooked in a microwave. I mean, if you're, if, if you're showing up and you're, and you're delivering value, the per, the person's going to, going to see it. Um, the, the prevalency of it is, whether you whether you have a fully functioning EDO, which is the model that I'm most familiar with, um, or whether you have a very active city manager's office, which certainly exists in a lot of places, the function is 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 still the same when you really look at it. It's that relationship building. It's the it's the generating the projects. Um, I would say in an in a normal world, um, a project generally takes eight months, nine months to a year and a half to happen. Um, but what you don't know is that 80% of the work that's done on an economic development project is done before a community even knows they were under consideration or still are under consideration. Um, more often than not, when we send a uh, uh, a community information packet out to a community, there are specific things that they're going to be able to tell us from a local level that we don't have as great a visibility on. But 90% of the information that we're asking for, we already have. And it will also give you an opportunity to raise some red flags. You know, if, if things are coming in, not a mistake, but maybe slightly uh, Askewing the information to, to their to their favor. Um, the nice thing about the hybrid, this is why I don't get invited to parties because I give long answers. Um, the the benefit of the hybrid approach is it, it'll. That was pretty funny. Wasn't it? So. Um, do they have Hardee's where you're from? <laughs> so like, are you talking about somebody here didn't invite you to Hardee's? <laughs> Both? Uh, uh, Carl, Carl Jr. is where they're from. Yeah. The, the, the advantage of the hybrid approach is it really truly is flexible and, and scalable. You can, you, can start, you can start with one person where a city manager says, I need you to go out and meet with all of these people and I need you to generate this marketing piece. And they go out and do it. And then based on the success that comes, you could add some research capacity. Uh, and then maybe within a year or two, you're, you're seeing enough activity, uh, specific to your question, Ronnie, um, that gives you enough confidence that you feel like you're not violating the public trust. Uh, from a from a fiduciary perspective that you feel confident going forward. So that's the advantage. If I was to make a recommendation based on everything I know about this community and the capacity that exists within the region and the state, I would say the hybrid approach is the best way to go and put all the pressure on Craig. You know, and I see I see the, the hybrid approach more or less as we continue to grow as somewhat of a, a measure. I think eventually we get to an economic development office, really, and, and grow into that. Um, and some of this is organizational. I mean, if you have, the hybrid approach has someone who's, who's reporting to the city manager and is talking about projects and prioritizing things because they have to use other assets of the city. So I, you know, you'd have to get in and, and prioritize all those. Where an EDO is more of a standalone kind of entity with its own budget and its own resources, and, and they don't need the day-to-day -day prioritization of things because they can do that on their own. And so some of it's just organizationally. Um, as far as the cell cycle approach, and Jim can correct me if I'm wrong, I, I think some of that depends on the size of the project. I mean, the bigger the project, the longer the cell cycle is going to be because it's going to be a lot more complex and you just have to wait it out. But 
but some of it's cumulative. And, and I will tell you, 10, 15 years ago, the cell cycle for Franklin was a lot longer than it is today because you know they brought in a lot of people. That people, it's a known entity. They've got the message out. They got everything out. So they're able to turn things a lot, probably a lot quicker than they did a long time ago. And I think we're experiencing right now a longer cell cycle because we haven't got that momentum, that inertia going as of yet. Um, but you land one or two projects. I mean, you, you know, looking at the numbers, even on a smaller project pays pays for an EDO. Um, am I wrong? No, absolutely right. And the key is, is you build those relationships with those who influence the projects. Um, you know, dealing with the real estate community is is vital, um, especially those who have national national ties. More often than not, somebody in another market will call up and say, "Hey, my national client is thinking about doing this." Um, they're looking at Middle Tennessee or the Southeast, and uh, you know, what, what do you got? I'd like for you to be my partner on this particular project. Knowing that person is pretty critical. Uh, so that they say, and especially if you can, what do, everybody wants everybody else to make their life easier for them. We, we need to become the easy button for site location decisions. We've got the data, we've got the process, we, we, we have the accessibility <clears throat> that when somebody says, I need a 24 acre site to build a class A office project, you know, with near this population base and this and that, boom, we hit it out and it's in their hands in 18 seconds, realistically. My goal always as an economic developer was to respond by the end of the day that I received it. And, and not just a, Oh, I've got this off the shelf. It's a true response that you built a model that could fill in all of the critical data. Um, that gets noticed because the thing that scares most companies when they get into constructing the project is, do I have a partner? Do, is that city going to have the capacity to be responsive and not you know, go crazy on me? As we're as we're dealing forward, and, and that goes back to the first comment I made. At the, yes, leadership's critical here, and the and the leadership you demonstrated is going to be well appreciated. I like the idea of having the hybrid approach, not only from the recruiting standpoint, but from the project management standpoint. That you know that that person who builds that relationship with the company that's coming in can also be the go-to person to help them walk through Perform. permits, planning, you know, that communication. But the one thing I would warn. Seeing how we've handled this in the past, there are some of those relationships that the, the companies are not going to want to deal with the government because they're secretive projects, and that they, you know, dealing with the dealing with the government, they're we're transparent in how we handle things, and there's a level of secrecy that. For instance, they don't want their employees to know that they're considering moving from California or they're considering moving from the East Coast. And, you know, with our, the way that the government, rightfully so, is set up, there are no secrets in the government because everything's public record. So I think it's critical to keep that approach where a corporation can reach out to Rutherford County, whether it be the chamber, and say, look, we're looking at moving, but this is highly confidential because we don't, want to have a mass exodus of our team from our existing company. And, and the hybrid approach, usually on those, we're not brought in until the deal is further along the line. Uh, well, I, I would, I, sorry, <laughs> Mayor, uh, I, we would be involved at the beginning. Now, um, they, they may bring something to us, but we may bring stuff and bring them in also to support us. I'm just fearful that we may lose out on some things if we don't have the ability to wear Companies can come, you know, and it yeah. be more. How, how I mean, we can, and yeah. the ones that you've seen, how, how does that work? Well, code names, um, careful with documents, proprietary information, and generally, if it, if it, it would generally be a larger project that's doing that, right. and it would have come through the state, so you continue to work in that relationship through the state or partner with your regional non governmental activity and say, you guys take on all this role and we'll take this, but see. The difference is right now is we kind of are in at the end with very little information being asked to incentivize things. And it's like, well, wait a minute. You know, that, that's hard for us sure. to figure it out. So if we were in, in the beginning, we can still shift all that information that doesn't want to be to kind of, we just 
frankly, yeah, my, wouldn't my point you guys is that the name most all of these larger corporations that we've dealt with in the past all require non-disclosure agreements to be right. signed by all those involved. And, and with a municipality, there are no non-disclosure agreements because everything's public record. We can't ask an employee that is communicating back and forth with a group to say, you can't disclose this if they're asked for that information because it's all public record which I think is, is good, but we just have to also be aware that there are some organizations that when we say, look, everything you send us is subject to public records, you, you know, and yeah. some companies are going to be thank you, but no thank you because we don't want our, our existing employment to know. When Harley Davidson was looking here years ago, um, we, we, that was before my time as mayor, but I mean, everyone was signing non disclosure agreements, and I remember the government, you know, us saying we, we can't do that, we right. can't sign a non disclosure agreement. So, if we go with a current with our creating our own EDO, we just need to know that there are some organizations that are not going to want to relocate if they're not don't have the availability, the ability to be anonymous on who they're, they're coming. So, if we were to target someone like that, we probably would turn them over to and work through a chamber, but we would have initiated the contact and then say everything goes there. And, you know, you know we do let companies know that there's an, there may be an issue here if you want to keep it confidential, so work with us on, on different things. I just wanted to bring that up. Yeah. It, it, yeah. That's a good point. It, more, more often than not, a company will um, go under a code name until they've selected a community or maybe a couple of communities. Uh, it, it makes it more difficult to do due diligence on the city's part, but uh, a lot of times you'll enter into a preliminary agreement that says, if you do this, this, and this, we're going to do this, this, and this, but this is fairly dependent on you doing this, this, and this, and, and being... Uh, I have a, a very large client that nobody knows who we are until we announce. The last thing that they want is some labor group <laughs> to announce, sure. you know, something happening. So yeah, it's just the expect expectation. If we have someone who's calling on people, mm -hmm. you know, to come to Murfreesboro, th those are we just need to be aware. So, okay. do y'all have any, Jim? You have anything? What What's our next step, Greg? Um, I think uh, what we anticipated is the council would take this and, and chew on it a little bit, and we can revisit it. Maybe make some decisions at least or answer additional questions if need be at the, at the um, uh, retreat, right? Okay. And uh, we'll keep working towards it. If we could, you know, if there's a decision that needs to get in the budget, I think we have enough time. This gives uh, us a good time, Council, that we can have this discussion at our, our budget and then determine how we want to fund that, and if we want to fund that through the through the budget process. Right out there. Mayor, can I ask one more question? Sure. Just because I think the additional information would be good. It would, at least it would be good for me. Um, Obviously, we're talking about differentiating Murfreesboro from other places and without naming other places. Um, I'd be very interested in um, what other places have in terms of this model so that I can have some good information about correlating success to what those other places are doing based on investments they're making in this specific area versus if they've got no investments in this area and they're still having great success or they've got investments and they're not having success, that information would be helpful to me. So I will have that ready prior to your retreat. Be great. Thank you. Perfect. And could, could I ask also that, I mean, it is... Uh, it's critical the person that you select to, 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 to do this, uh, too. So maybe a job description or something, that how you're going to, you know, what that's going to be, because this is kind of, I mean, all of what we're talking about is already being done by our staff, but it's, it's this is sharpening the pencil a little bit and getting a little bit more intentional about what we're trying to do and getting that go-to person. And the two skills I see from this is that one, has to, you have to know the community, and the resources and assets of a community. But you've got to know these relationships at a different level, a different tier. So how do you go about identifying that person that's going to do that job? And I think that's going to be a real critical decision. And is the market there? Is that availability in that person, that skill set around and easily available? Or, you know, anywhere? That, that's going to be a real critical decision. Okay. So. I will, I will add that to the Ronnie list. That will also be done in time. <laughs> can I ask one more question? Hey, Jim. Ronnie list here. <laughs> Jim, can I ask one more question? Um, is that, is, 
uh, it's just the way my brain works a little bit, but is that type of a position, are there incentives like for that person or is it more of just a salary kind of typical, the, you know, I, I, it, look, it looks and smells and feels to me like a more of a sales rep type. All, all production related. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking you bring a bunch of high paying jobs, maybe that number's this versus if you don't, if you fail, maybe the number's something different. That's just where my brain works. But no, is it, it typically a salary deal or is it an incentive based deal? Because, I mean, look, we don't have a lot of that. Within so. within within a municipal organization, it would be a salaried position. Okay. Um, within a, a a private or a public private organization, there would generally be a performance bonus associated with it. But couldn't we, as a city, couldn't we put? A, we we talked about this years ago, and I'm not bringing this up now. But performance based pay, but. Um, but no, I'm just saying, I'm not bringing this up for the entire... It's no. like that Liberty Mutual commercial. Isn't that what you just did? No. I'm just saying for this position that, I mean, it's... it's I mean, if, a guy, if, if, if the person who has this position brings in a corporation that has 500 jobs at $90,000 a job, I mean, is there a way to incentivize that position? You're looking at the wrong guy. Because <laughs> I'm not going to jail for you. <laughs> this is jail. I'm not talking about under the table. I mean, I'm just saying on a contract, wouldn't there be a way with a contract that we incentivize that there's metrics that go in there? I don't think there's any prohibition on doing that. Um, it, it would it would be somewhat foreign to the way we do it. And we could look at the way that other compensation is. And generally, if you're on a, on a salary and you're performing well, you come back and say, if you want me to stay, you pay me more. And so the, it kind of turns into that anyway. So, Just so, so we can not standing alone, alone I would support you with that too. Just so you know. <laughs> I would too. I mean, I'm not, it, it's, well, I mean, Ronnie knows this. It's like in a bank, the highest paid people in the bank are your mortgage officers because they are just in the money. Turning production out. So if if this person is is right. producing at the level that it's creating jobs inside the city, I'm just saying I like the idea. I don't mind putting an incentive approach on that. That someone's you know working, busting their rear end to bring yeah. bring economic development to the city. So anyway, it's just a thought. Five an hour plus commission. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> Waiting tables. Yeah. On tip. Yeah. All right. So hey, uh, you, you've got the the Ronnie list, and yeah, if. Right. We, so if we could have that ready for our retreat, then we can discuss this more in more detail at the retreat because we need to get through these other other items. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you for your hard work on this. All right, we're going to move to our solid waste ordinate revisions and fees. Oh, I had this year. That's how you <laughs> Hey, Dan, you got two minutes. All right. Uh, I sent you this PowerPoint last night. Or Good afternoon, by the way, Council Mayor. Thanks for the opportunity <laughs> to come before you. Uh, try to give a little head start, get the juices flowing maybe last night or at the end of the day and uh, get a head start on some of these, these items. So I'm going to go through this. It's, it's relatively short, and I'll go through it uh, fairly quickly. Um, it has more to do with the fee towards the end. I think that may be more, more of the interest. All right, what am I doing? All right, here we go. Uh, this was just uh, some pictures of some of the some of the uh, things we've seen out on our brush and limb uh, pickup curbside pickup service. Not, not so good practices. Uh, just to identify and show you all kind of the challenges that they they the drivers meet day to day. They're they're trying to pick this stuff up with a clamshell knuckle boom. Some of these things are not conducive to pick, picking up with that apparatus. And really, uh, for example, the loose grass and those hedge apples down there, there's really not a good mechanism to, uh, to uh, it takes extra work to pick those up, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Uh, so real quick through, this is a high level summary of the, of the ordinance revisions. The last time we met about this, uh, we had talked about prohibiting loose grass clippings. I think the middle compromise we came in was that we would still allow it, but we would start charging a fee for it. So we, we are proposing that it's a, if it's bagged, it's free. If it's not bagged, it's loose, you're going to pay. Subject to your approval or change. 
Leaves uh, do have to be bagged between January 16th and October 9th. During uh, October 10th through January 15th, that's our leaf disposal. That's when we're running our uh, vacuum trucks to pull the leaves in. So just to let you know, the folks that pull the leaves in on the in the leaf season, those are the ones that are really mowing <laughs> in the summer season for the city. So the, these folks kind of transition roles between the winter and the summer. So, but you can loosely pile those up as, as has always been the case. Uh, just further clarification that private lawn and tree service establishments uh, don't use the curbside, uh, the city curbside service, but this does offer them the opportunity to take their uh, brush and limb to the recycling facility off Florence Road and we would process it and charge them a fee. Uh, don't want to get too busy here. I'm just kind of highlighting in yellow the, the, the current free services and I'll put in orange um, kind of what we're charging is, or stating would be an, an additional charge if the ordinance went through. Obviously the $750 and the $30, that's already established. We're saying that the drop-off center, $0 if you're still using our uh, convenience center. You would still get free service if you had a six, eight cubic yards or less. Uh, you would still get a zero charge if you had bag grass. However, if you have larger uh, limb and brush disposal needs or if you put in loose grass clippings, that would be a fee. Uh, we, would we would pick up commercial curbside collection. It would be $150 if somebody <coughs> from a commercial business wanted us to pick up. Uh, at the curbside, we would charge 150 per load. Again, uh, at the drop-off facility, we would say, if you're a Murfreesboro resident, you're free to drop off anything at our Florence Road facility. If you are commercial, you would be paying $75 per ton, $75 minimum. Bulk item collection uh, would be limited. To we'd still let you for up to three items, would be free of charge. Anything over three, uh, it would be at $30 per item. And then uh, replacement of solid uh, waste carts is current market. I think that's actually per our charter. It's what Aaron has no, told us. We can't ch charge anything but current. And then so special solid event waste services, and I would even classify this as property cleanup services. If there's a property that basically somebody's moved out and dumped a bunch of stuff on the curbside, that we would uh, <coughs> Cannesburg event, or if there's a uh, Main Street event or a square event that we would come in and, and work with whoever was sponsoring that event to, to determine what the fee would be or the price would be for us to uh, uh, provide the solid waste services. Yes, sir. On the bulk item collection, the three items, so so that's what will keep somebody from saying, I want you to come pick up these three items today and next the next three items the next day and the next three items the next day. Yeah. Nothing? I mean, you Nothing. just... If you, we'll get, there, there will be, there, there, and not to say this the wrong way and in a, a bad way, but there are some, there's some gaming that goes on currently and you just have to deal with it. Most people don't do that, but yeah. there's some people that, that will take advantage of it and you just have to kind of, that's cost of doing business. We're really talking about, Darren, if I'm wrong, we're really talking about landlords who own property and they're throwing away when a tenant moves out, they're throwing away all their stuff in the front yard. I mean, right. th that's really what we're dealing right. with. That's, that's a, that, that one is, that's, that's exactly where we, we right now, we don't have, we just get a call and hey, there's garbage all along the frontage of a certain apartment and we just have to go pick it up. And then a big one is mattresses too, right? Mattresses. Uh, really, we can pick up mattresses and furniture. Any kind of appliances or electronics, those have to go. Uh, I know the county charges you to get rid of your appliances or your, your uh, electronics. And I guess we don't pick up refrigerators or dishwashers or anything like that. They have. Hey, Darren, um, why wouldn't we charge? Why wouldn't we charge a fee? For for it, no just, for the buck item collection. We 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 could. I think we just were trying to take a. a I don't know a. a less aggressive approach and just give people up to three items and then after that you charge. I mean, we know who most of those people are that are going to be putting those items out there. Um, 
I, I think we need to charge uh, some uh, one-time fee or something, okay. whether it's $150, $175. Uh, that will make people think twice about putting that, uh, those items out there on the side. Right. So we can go in and we can say a certain flat fee for up to three items and then $30 beyond that. And that's why this is in front of you. So you guys can send me your suggestions and we can craft this a different way. This is just, this is kind of staff's, uh, kind of our recommend, recommendations at this point in draft form, but it's obviously we, will, we can change it however you'd like. How, how are you going to uh, charge it? Well, it's, it's the new system, the routeware system, where we have the ability to take pictures. So we would be going up to these houses, and the, the, the trucks are getting outfitted with the hardware kind of as we speak. So we haven't gotten the system in operation yet, but we would be taking, the driver would come up, there's a, there's a special button, it says a special fee, they hit that button, it takes a picture, the cameras are mounted where it would take a picture of the brush and limb or the, the bulk items or the grass or whatever that we're saying is a special charge and it would send that picture along with their GPS location and the street address back to a central dispatcher. For now we would have to manually put that onto the water bill since it's going through the Murfreesboro Water and CUD. Uh, we wouldn't, I wouldn't want to invest in a automated integration of those systems just yet till we see how much effort that's going to be but yeah it would be a picture so the person would get their get a picture and an added added uh, line item on their water bill no. so the landlord wouldn't necessarily the charged. landlord wouldn't necessarily be charged it would, it would be whoever is whoever has the water service in their name would be the the issue we do have a ability in the water water system to identify a landlord in case somebody skips out <laughs> on you know leaves and abandons the service and that uh, we we need to make our landlord uh, system a little more robust though I'll be the first one to say that so that brings up another question if let's say it is a rental property goes through an eviction and you got a new tenant that signs up for it is that new tenant going to get charged that fee since the yeah, they got disconnected uh, we've talked about that too. That'd probably just be a write-off, honestly. There's there's situations where we have water. People leave the water. They leave with an outstanding water bill, and you never find them. They've left town, and you just have to write that off. That's just again kind of cost of doing business. Yeah. That, that that's kind of my concern with a landlord or an eviction situation. This this landlord empties everything out to the street. Yeah, somebody needs to pay for it. But this person's probably already stiffed them for rent, stiffed them for damages, stiffed them for everything. Now we got to charge this landlord to go haul the trash off on top of it. Yeah, somebody's got to pay for it, but we gotta, right. that needs to be streamlined a little bit. But at that point, the landlord should be responsible for cleaning yeah. the house. I mean, it's not, no, no, I, I'm, I'm down with that. Yeah. 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 Landlord out. I mean, I, I would, Sean, I'd, I'd equate it to the unruly um, gathering ordinance we put in place when we were dealing with all the issues we had over close to the university, and ultimately, you know, the landlord's responsible for it. Yeah, no, no, yeah. yeah, yeah somebody's got to pay for it. I yeah. just, with this billing thing, if it gets put off on the next tenant. Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah, 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 we the next tenant. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, we yeah. got to figure out if the, how it's built out to make sure it hits the landlord and not the. Our, our system is built such that we can identify the property owner, kind of underwriting, I guess, the renter's uh, service. So if the renter jumps out, we can go find the landlord. Now, again, that's not as robust as, as it should be, uh, and we need to work on that. And that's been something, honestly, as, as I was working through the solid waste stuff, I thought, man, we need to get our water landlord uh, uh, structure in a better, better shape. So this will spur that on, quite honestly, to make sure that we get that stuff done. But we're not going to pass it on to the next. Uh, yeah, that's all I was worried about. Yeah. The, the, right, landlord, right, right. the landlord should get yeah. hit with it. I just don't want yeah. the next tenant to get hit with it. Right. 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 Darren, i got a quick question on bag grass clippings. And <laughs> yeah, it's sure. more from how have we, for those of us that are in the construction industry, we have our friendly inspectors from our um, stormwater department who will let us know if we're keeping our curbs clean or if our if our grates and inlets are being protected or if our streets are dirty you know because we protect what's going into our stormwater system how have we gotten away all these years allowing grass clippings to be piled next to our stormwater system when we're telling contractors you've got to go to all extreme methods possible to protect what's going in our stormwater but yet, with our with our grass clippings, we're like park them, put them on the curb, and it all washes into the, st the stormwater. 
How have we gotten away with that? Well, we just have not had an enforcement arm or mechanism to deal with it. So, it, so to, to put it, one of the things in the ordinance that we're talking about is should we equip some solid waste people with the ability to cite residents with a penalty or a citation or whatever like building and codes officials can do or do we have to go get building and codes officials and bring them in to you know like the property maintenance issues that the building and codes comes in so honestly I that's a good question it's not, I don't have a great answer I mean for I don't you. mean that is in, in in I don't mean that against our, our department but what I'm I'm saying is my, my guess is this will be a, a, a change for the homeowners knowing that they have to be bagged but from the construction industry we're used for years yep. I mean we get fined we have to get out with shovels on the street to clean yep. up construction if we've got gravel that's in the curbs we get in trouble for having gravel that washes down the stormwater system so I mean we've we've required this of our commercial people right for years yeah but we've not required that on the on the, the bag I, I don't one I don't think that our folks know that the, the problem. I still don't think people are very educated about how the storm system works and that that grass gets down in there and goes to the streams and is a, and is a source of pollution. People don't really necessarily see grass as a pollutant. Um, the other thing is, is I think we want to take a very soft approach to this and actually maybe go get some bags printed, some some briefs, some some uh, uh, biodegradable bags. And the first fence, we drop a bag at the front door or put it out. We pick it up. And we just leave them a biodegradable bag, and maybe we, or we got pickets that we put into their yard. Say, hey, just to let you know, this is no longer an accepted practice. It can damage our storm sewer system. It takes much more effort to pick up. There's a higher cost to the city, so we're really, you know, we, you got to put it in a bag. And so I think we would go through multiple attempts to communicate to folks the the need before we started, you know. Okay. Yes, I, it's just a point that we've been doing this for a long time. I, I go down Indian Hills right now, and if you go down Black Bear, there's about seven or eight homes that have a pile of grass that literally could fit into a one-gallon bucket. They're sitting on the curb. It's 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 they just don't. They've just been doing it. For, nobody's ever told them that it's not. Not to mention that our our knuckle boom claws just it's, destroy it, the pavement is there it, is it there, does you know? it, it's very, it takes a very good operator to pick up a loose grass without damaging the pavement do y'all have any questions on are you wanting us to vote on this or no no know? this is just this is the draft ordinance i'm just putting okay. this in front of you because it is it, it, to, to solicit input and if you see something you like or dislike to let me know and we'll bring it up at a later date um <coughs> At another council meeting. Just a technical question, just so we so. Is there any magic behind the October tenth day, other than, I mean, can, can we just not make it October first, so it's a little easier for everybody to know? <laughs> Raymond, I guess Raymond and Russell are here. They're the ones that are going to handle the technical. It could questions. be like the first Saturday after the full moon in September. <laughs> <laughs> No, are you is October first or fifteenth or something? Does that matter? Yeah, magical about it. That's usually about that's just our say stated time, right? Yes, that's about right. So nothing magical about it. If we were gonna do something, maybe we just do a, an even number rather than a beginning of the month to an end of a month. I get it. Might just make it easier. Yeah. Maybe Got it. maybe do it mid twelve oh one AM October first. <laughs> Specify the time. All right. Mr. Gold. Yeah, yes, ma'am. Uh whatever we decide to do. Would it be possible to notify by the citizens if we put a some kind of notification in their uh, billing? Yeah, we can do that. Absolutely, a mailer or a, an insert, a yeah. bill insert. Sure, sure. Yeah, on all the changes. Yes, ma'am. Could I throw one more thing out there for us to consider? Um, and I don't know if this makes sense from a grass clipping standpoint or who's going to be handling this. And I, I, I'm just. This is just coming off the cuff here as a brainstorm, but you know, p potentially someone who might have a physical disability or something like that, yeah. or you know, whether that be because of that system. Injury. Yes, that system. I'm sorry to interrupt, but that system does have where drivers can flag if there's a disability at that address, so they know they need to go either. They actually have to go pick up the garbage maybe by the home or if it's in the back of the home. So if there's a physically disabled resident, we can that that does get flagged and noted. 
I guess we, I'm thinking about from a, from a standpoint of charging and stuff like that too. Would we may want to consider whether or not we have the same? I don't know. I'm brainstorming here. I don't want, want to venture off anything. I don't. I'm not really prepared to talk about because I'm not. I'm just kind of thinking out loud here. That right, right. Right. We may want to account for that somehow. So maybe if you guys think about that a little bit and give us some ideas, that it might be a good way to think about that. Okay. And another thing I was thinking about when Mr. Lalanne said that, you know, the res the uh, citizens that we put an extra charge on their bill for whatever reason, um, how are we going to keep that collection from being like the traffic ticket collection I, I, if they refuse to pay it, you know, because we lose a lot of money with people not paying the traffic ticket. Uh, oh, no, what we, steps will we go to to get the bills paid. It's a red light camera. Mm -hmm. well, I, I think it's an account. Are you talking about just how we account for that money? Yeah, what, what? yeah you know, you have, if you add that. water and sewer bill, right? Right. Yeah, so Madeline, it's, I think it's going to be collected on the, yes. either your, your CUD water bill or the Murfreesboro water resources bill. So it'd be on that, it'd be on that bill. So, you know, technically I think if somebody just said, I'm not paying it, then their water would get turned off if they don't, if they don't pay the bill. Right. Right, I was thinking if I got a bill and had that charge, and I'm not being critical, I'm just saying this is how people may think, and we have to be ready for it. If I get that, let's say I get a $30 extra charge for whatever reason. Well, since we have itemized uh, billing, I would look to see what only my water and sewer and all that charge is, and that's all I'm going to pay. And the other I want, won't pay it, so I just wonder. If we're going to be prepared for that, you know, someone does partial payment, leave out the extra charge. Do we compound it or keep billing them for it? Just something to think about. Darren, maybe if you come up, that's a good question. Maybe if you'll come up, what happens if someone doesn't pay the bill? Right. Just, uh, well, in part of the ordinance says that the the lack of payment would adhere to the discontinuation of service with water with Murfreesboro or CUD water. Let's go, so, in, go so into that. We have, a, we have a ceiling right now that says we don't turn you off until you have an outstanding balance of above $50. So, right. if, so if somebody didn't pay, it may, it, may, it may actually be 75 now. Anyway, we, we, we kind of have a forgiveness threshold and until you get above that $75, let's say, ceiling amount, that's when it triggers us to actually, we reach out, we've got an IVR system that contacts you, gives you a message, we send you a text if we have your cell phone number, to tell you that you are subject to cutoff now that your outstanding balance is, is beyond this ceiling amount. But I don't, I don't think we would be able to distinguish that between water and solid waste. It would just be whatever the outstanding amount is, we would just have to apply the payment to the solid waste first, and then the second portion of the payment would get applied to the water and sewer service if they were short. So if y'all have any more questions, that'll be yeah, coming yeah. to us. When, when are we thinking that'll come to us, Craig? Okay. Next, will you, will you be ready next Thursday, you think? Oh, uh, ordinance itself? Next Thursday, either the next meeting or the following. Okay. In short order. Okay, right. sure. <laughs> I'll be ready. <laughs> I'll be ready. The, the more you change the draft, the farther away the, the ready will be, right? That's right. Uh, so let's, yes, okay, sir. Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I was going to move to the next item. Okay. Oh, no. I'm. This is, all right, I'm going fast now. <laughs> okay. So, incorporation of the, <laughs> all right, that's my cue to uh, hit fifth gear here. Uh, we're going to incorporate our collection design criteria to establish, establish discontinuation as we just talked about in accordance with uh, CUD Murphy's Real Policies. Real quick, uh, the review, the, the solid waste, the 40, this, this has to deal with the solid waste fee itself and whether or not you all are interested at all in changing it Sorry. or keeping it where it's at. Uh, we've got, in, in July of 19, we had just over 45,000 carts. We're just over 46,000 now. That's roughly 2,500 added, the 1,400 removed. Those 1,400 that were removed are primarily the commercial uh, cans. So, uh, real. This is this. I don't want this to be too complicated. But right now, the orange bar is seven fifty per month per resident. The thirty dollars is the commercial fee. Mm -hmm. What that does for us is that recovers seventy four percent of our operating expenses, 
and it recovers 66% of total expenses. And total expenses is operating expenses plus debt service. Debt service. So that's where we stand right now, is we're recovering 66%, two thirds total, about three quarters of operating. In order to get to, let's call it the 100% operating uh, expense recovery, we need to be at 1050 and 3750. We still don't recover total expenses, but we're at 101% of operating. Mm -hmm. If we wanted to recover everything, total expenses, and this actually has some new debt on it, we need to be at $13.50 and $40. So that just gives you an idea of where we are from a recovery standpoint. So let's fo push forward to when we think the landfill may close. Well, we, we'll have to talk about that on other business. If yeah, you don't no, no, well, I'm, I'm talking from a money standpoint. I'm just talking the cost to the citizen yeah. for a service. Right now, we're estimating that if if, if, it, if the landfill closes July 1 of 2025, we're going to go from a $9 million annual budget to about a $14 million, right? So that's about a 55% increase. That's because these uh, top three, we're going to have to start truck hauling. We're going to have to pay tipping fees in an altar landfill, and we got new debt service and some new employees, too, to run the transfer station. What that looks like is we need to be at $21.5 for residential fee, and we've got $45 per month for commercial. That's that's 100%. So now we talk about how do we want to get there if, if, we're, if we're predicting correctly that July 1, 2025 is the, is the day that the middle point gets closed out. I call this the stair-step approach. If we go from current 750, 850, 10, you can see that 1250. This is when the, the, we go to the 2150. But if we wanted to take that, that basically says that the solid waste fee generates 43.4 million, and the city general fund has to subsidize about 11.3 million if we stair step it. If we took kind of hold the fee, keep it at 750 until the landfill closes, it stays 750 and 30 bucks. We're going to project. We're going to we're going to generate about 31 and a half million with the solid waste fee, and the, the city general is going to have to subsidize 23 million. Uh, the last slide here is if we wanted to just go to the self-funding. What does it take if we wanted the fee to? We didn't want. I've got I've got the city general fund that's subsidizing 2.6 million, but that's because of our current. For some reason, I did it from FY21 through 26, but that's what will shortfall this current year. But if moving forward to, to recover, oh, we go from 750, 1150 for two years, 1350 for two years, and then 2150. So again, this is those are the three different approaches you can take. Keeping it flat, you just understand how the city general fund is going to have to subsidize, and I can get you the slides on this if you need it. And uh, I have no, I have no real recommendation to, to give you all other than what you see as the appropriate move forward on adjusting the fee. These are discussions we can have in our budget meetings, as far as you know, you guys can kind of quarterback that we a little bit. Don't have anything. We don't have anything programmed in yet on the budget for any sort of solid waste fee increase. Will you go back to that stair step approach? Yeah. Were those were those slides in your what you sent us? I didn't. They they these slides were in that. Yes, program? sir. Okay. If they weren't, then. <clears throat> so the yeah. stair step yeah. special delivery. I remember saying. <laughs> so I could give you the PowerPoint itself, so you can I just actually to see those last three slides. Okay. I thought that would be. Yeah. Hey, just to make sure I'm seeing where these these incremental changes are. Would that would that 850 number? Would that be what we need to be talking about in our budget right now for July 1? July 1? Yes. Okay. Yes. The seven. I guess that's why I did it, really, for FY21, just to show that we're currently at seven and a half dollars Gotcha. All right. Raising it a dollar would equal to about, about half a million, maybe a little over. Yeah. Okay. Any questions? I, now's probably just a good time to need anything to wait to to other business, but we received a letter since Darren's here, second hand that went. Um, Joey Smith, our our 
former solid waste director. Joey's an assistant, assistant director, assistant director mm -hmm. now. Joey chairs the Central Tennessee Solid Waste Regional Board, and part of the TCA code on expansions of landfills has to go to that board, and then it also goes to TDEC as well. Tell me if I'm mis misstating that. No, you're not misstating. It goes to that uh, re Central uh, Regional Board uh, Committee, and then they make a recommendation to TDEC. So the county had their first public... Um, Darren, the name of their board... That, that, Commissioner Cush, is it Public Works? So they had their first Public Works. They're opening the um, RFIs that come across one at a time. Um, so we've not been included in that RFI process, the, the municipality. We've had discussions with Mayor Ketrin and his staff on, on how they're proceeding, but um, we received a letter yesterday that went to Mr. Gore where Republic has requested um, to TDEC and to this Central Tennessee Solid Waste Regional Board to increase their trash volume. Their current cubic yards is 38,766,590, and they're wanting to increase that an additional 32 million cubic yards, which is about 95% of what their the current landfill is, and that would be extending on the back side of the landfill going to from um, Lebanon Highway 231 from the back of that all the way out to Jefferson Pike. And we were caught off guard, I think, um, to say the least, because the RFI process with the county has been going on, you know, and talking to their attorney yesterday, um, you know, part of their R, apparently part of their RFI process, it does have in that as a component expanding the cell at, at, at Middle Point, but we've not been included in that, so there's not been any discussion that we've had on um, the expansion. So what I think I'm I'm 100% against as many complaints as we've gotten over the last two or three years and as much work as our solid waste group has put into mitigating and, or dealing with the smell on the north side of town and really not just the north side of town. It's gotten, I mean, I think we had complaints from eight miles away um, from, from Middle Point, but the council is going to have to make the decision on how we want to proceed. Um, you know, I, I talked to uh, commit, uh, Representative Terry and Senator Reeves last night, um, and they were going to schedule meetings with TDEC. But uh, you know, I think it's a bad deal. I think it's bad right now. We've this discussion that we're going through right now, and what we've talked about for six and a half years now, is going with the assumption we put that fee in place originally because the assumption that the landfill was going to close and we needed to get to self-sufficiency because we were going to have to start hauling trash. That's why we did it. Um, and now the, the, the information we've gotten says that the landfill has gone from, when I first got elected mayor, it was 10 years, then it went to eight, then it went to six, then it went back up to eight, and now the report says there's 10 years, eight months left on the landfill now. Um, based on current growth and there's 34 individual counties and municipalities that are bringing trash into Rutherford County so we're going to have to make the decision we don't get to vote on it we don't get a say on whether they expand or not but we're going to have to make a decision as a council how aggressively we want to pursue whether it be in resolution form um, and with the county what we want to let them know on whether we are wanting to challenge that or not. So that's really where the discussion needs to start on how we need to let Darren and his team know how to proceed. So I'll first saying we can't, I mean, we don't have it on the agenda to vote, but I'm, I'm willing to do whatever we need to do to say that that landfill doesn't need to expand in, in, in the county or in, in, in Murfreesboro. Is it, is it, is it, am I understanding right that what they've done is just apply straight to the state for this so that there really isn't a, I mean, is there a need for an RFI or RFP or any of that if they just get the approval from, from the state? So, you know, I'm, I'm, I've asked Joey, and I'll reiterate it here with Russell and Raymond, we need to get the path forward and the timelines associated. The package included a letter to this regional public or this regional solid waste committee, of which Joey is the chair, 
same date was a was a letter to TDEC applying for the for the deal. So I, when I talked to Joey, there has to be a public hearing, and the the regional planning body looks to see if the request is consistent with their annual planning report. Apparently, this regional this it covers you know several counties. They do an, an annual planning report every year that's filed with the state. So they look to see if it's consistent with their APR. They make record and they have to conduct a public hearing. Then uh, they send their recommendation to TDEC, and TDEC either has to have one or two public hearings prior to their approval. But uh, per Joey, there's no county approval process that goes forward here. Now, if the county goes through their process, and I would, I'm speculating, but if they, if they identify a, an alternative solution uh, to Republic, uh, that would probably, if Republic gets the land, the landfill expanded and there's a continued zero tipping fee charge to the county, I would expect the county may change their position and, and continue to, to take the, the uh, their, the, the, the county's trash to the public. So I'm not sure what role the county has to play here other than they are the, the governing body that's uh, responsible for dealing with the county's trash. They can choose to do whatever they want with that trash, but I, I would expect if they have a landfill that gets an approved expansion, that's going to be the, 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 the least cost, highest you know, benefit solution. I mean, it's going to grow. It's going to double, or 38. It's, about, it's going to grow by 90 percent if TDEC approves it. Whether we send our trash there, or or the county sends their trash there, or not, if TDEC approves it. So it sounds like our discussion needs to be with the state at this level. Yeah, if, I mean, that, if anything. I mean, I, I said the, the, listen. The, I, the only way that the county gets involved is if I guess if there's some some new property that's required as part of the expansion. Right. If Republic owns the entire tract that they're expanding on, then I don't know necessarily that the county has any. It's my understanding after talking to several different individuals that TDEC is the final say. Uh, so I, I would say to TDEC personally that I've noticed that the bigger it gets, the worse the problem gets <laughs> with the smell, which means if it's going to grow twice as much, it's going to be twice as stanky. And maybe it's, you know, instead of me smelling at my office on the square, it might be in Barfield or whatever. It's already there. Yeah. You know, it, I, I mean, I'm, Sorry, I know where my choice is on this and whatever we need to do, I, I'm on the team of saying, let's try to be as aggressive as we can be to let them know how we feel about it and, and, and doubling it or 90% or whatever is not what I'd want to have happen. I made the comment today on the radio and it's probably, I mean, I'm, I'm passionate and upset about it because we've been working on this for so long. And, you know, to go even know that their RFI apparently has that in the process. I mean, we met with them 90 days ago in the administrative conference room to present all the information that we've spent. I don't know how much money we've spent in labor hours and, and, and equipment, but it's pr it's well over, I would assume, over $100,000 on what we've spent uh -huh. just to say, hey, this is a this is a stink, or as you said, it's a stank issue. It's not a sewer issue. And, you know, I'm, I'm not saying they were being hiding or whatever, but that never got brought up that, um, that we were going to expand that. And then Kurt and I sat five years ago on the solid waste committee and GBB or GGB, you know, mm -hmm. ca came back with, hey, the best thing to do is to have middle point 2.0. And I'm, I remember the two of us sitting there going, you've got to be kidding that we've gone through this whole process. We've spent all this money and you're telling us the easiest thing to do is make the landfill bigger. And we were like, well, no joke. We could have told you that before we went through the, the process. And so we all said, that's the least option that we would like to see. We don't want to see that. Um, so piggybacking on that, I think our route would be to let our delegation, our, our state delegation, to let the governor, to let TDEC, and every other person in between that's, that has to make this decision know the issues that we have in the community that we are currently dealing with. Um, and, you know, I talked to Mayor Ketcher, and I think on Monday, and he was surprised that they had gone that route. But, 
uh, you know, it's one of those things just like what we've dealt with over this last year. There are things that are out of our control, and this is one of them, but I don't mean think it means that we we stop saying that it's bad for our, our community. My, my other question I had is based on the agreement that we that was signed in the late 80s, early 90s, we're processing how many gallons of leachate from that landfill every day? Uh, it's between 200 and 250,000 gallons a day. So I, I would like the city to look at if they say that they're going to double it, then we can say, well, you need to find another place to be able to process your leachate that we don't want to do it, if that's a possibility. The, the, only, the, only, the only caveat of that agreement is, is that what, that's what affords the city and the county free, free disposal services at the landfill. It's, it's considered a, a basic quid pro quo. You take all our garbage for free, we process all your leachate for free. But if we decide we don't want to take their, their leachate anymore, then we would just be subject to you know, their tipping fees. Well, but I mean, we may could look at it to where we're processing the leachate in the existing landfill and the agreement stays in place for the existing landfill, but when you're wanting to modify that agreement to double it, then we say, look, we don't want to double, we don't want to process. I'm sure double. that there's some attorneys that could look through that <laughs> and, <laughs> and figure out a way to wordsmith it. Yeah, I mean, we just need, the council needs to decide if we want to ask staff to start preparing our information for us to send something to the state. Um, my vote would be yes on that. Sounds like you're on board, so. Yeah, I think, I think that's what we need to do, ASAP. I mean, this just came, I mean, I, I just heard about this t this morning uh, with the comments that you made, and, and I, I don't know, uh, I'm a little hesitant to move that quickly, but I certainly am sensitive to the, what's happened uh, and what the problem is, and I don't want to see it grow, but I'm, I'm not sure exactly how to proceed. I, I feel like I need to know more about what's what's transpired, but maybe all that's transpired is what y'all said. I don't know. How about, we, can we do this? If we have you guys kind of start headed down a direction to prepare something, whether that's some resolution or something that just says, yeah. this is sort of what we want to happen. Yeah, that, that would we, right. It wouldn't be something we're going to, they're going to, y'all don't hit the send button yeah. until yeah, we've all, that's, <laughs> that's what I'm until like we've say. looked at so it. So just to be clear, any resolution that comes to the council, they're non-binding resolutions, but we have to vote on that just like we would any other ordinance before it's sent on. Okay. So, I mean, that really... Yeah, we could learn a lot more in that meantime, yeah. too. I don't know. That's, is, that's it. Yeah, now I've got to visualize if it, it was something. If... if that, and that's one, but I think it'd be good to send the information that we have, okay. that we've received, sure. Sure. the actual application, to send that out to everyone. Just so. to clarify, this expansion was in the RFI. It just hasn't been opened yet, so when they they applied to the state in this middle area that just happened that was no that was found out before the rfi was opened it's my understanding that a it may not be an expansion that was this big is in the rfi there's something with us with a cell expansion in the rfi but it's my understanding that there was a discussion at the planning or at the public works last week that something got brought up uh, obviously commissioner um Piercy from the Las Casas area has been very adamant of not expanding that landfill. As a matter of fact, three years ago, Mayor Burgess had requested um, the county to allow Republic to do core samples in their, their, their existing landfill, the county's existing landfill, about mining the landfill out and allowing that to be mined out and then refilled with more trash, and the, the county commission voted not to do that. And I think, as a matter of fact, I think they put a moratorium on allowing anything to be done with that. So apparently there's been some discussion that happened last week that made this letter, I think it's dated Sunday. Is it's what Sunday, the, yeah. The letter was dated yeah. that, that fast-forwarded that forward because of maybe some comments that were made at the county level. Um, so that's why that, that happened. Johnny, are you okay with them going down that route of Ronnie? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I just heard of this when we got into this meeting, so I didn't even know that. So I feel like I'm a little blindsided by that. So, I mean, the obvious question to me is why would they do that? Now, 
I have an answer that immediately pops into my head why they would do that, but I would like to at least ask the question and have them sure. answer the question. So, well, I mean, I'm fine asking. I, I was joking when I said that I, I was just going to on my. I put a post out this morning just notifying the public of what was happening, and I think there's been twelve or fifteen thousand people who've already looked at that post, and I was. I was jokingly saying they were asking who should we contact, and I was going to put the BFI general manager's email on there that that's who you need to contact. I didn't. I didn't think that would be very mayoral. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> I wanted it. Republic. Is what you Republic. Mean. I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. Republics. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I, I'm perfectly fine asking them to come before the council and explain, you know, let them inform us of what they're planning on doing and why they're planning on doing it. I think that'd be great. That'd be great. Yeah, that, that, that's great. Yeah, so, Darren, can, can I get a motion? I'll extend the invitation. I don't know if we will uh, accept it I think not. this will probably be, be better. Can I get a motion that we request? So we, moved. Re, Second. All right, we've got a motion to request Republic to come uh, before the council to uh, inform us of what they're planning and why they're planning on. Uh, expanding the landfill. Thanks. You, you, got get, you got a motion. Who, do we have a second? Yeah, second. All right. A motion a second. All those in favor, please say aye. Uh, aye. We got have Madeline. Aye. Oh, I'm sorry. All those in uh, Miss Wright, please call the roll. Vice <laughs> Mayor Skills Harris. Vice Mayor Skills Harris. Aye. Mr. Lalance. Aye. Mr. Martin. Aye. Mr. Shacklett. Aye. Mr. Wade. Aye. Mr. Wright. Aye. Mayor McFarland. Aye. All right, thanks, thanks everyone. All right, we're now going to move to a um, discussion on the transit rebrand. All right, uh, Mayor, City Council, it's uh, time for Rover the Big Bus Dog to retire. Um, so are we euthanizing yeah. Rover? That's, that's bad. Peter people aren't going to like that. So, uh, in dog years, Rover should have been gone a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> it gets worse. Much well, like my good friend Gary Whitaker, he just keeps hanging around. So. Anyway, um, it is time to update and, and modernize the service and, and make it something that's more recognizable, uh, not just for the city, but for this type of service that it is, uh, especially for out-of-town visitors and, and new residents. Um, it goes along with the uh, you know, subject we were on earlier about uh, development of the city and <coughs> moving us further along into the future. So we uh, had a few internal uh, discussions about uh, name options and so on. Um, uh, we narrowed it down to a couple different names and then we sent those names out to some local vendors to um, come up with some logo ideas. Um, we got those in. Uh, narrowed those down, uh, and then we've got three of them here that we would like for uh, the city council to hopefully uh, pick one out today so that we can move forward and get that information to um, our bus vendor uh, that we're buying the buses from. Uh, that needs to be done pretty quick. So at any rate, uh, we'll go on with that, make sure I'm pushing the right button. So um, again, there's two name options, three different logos. Um, there's the simple uh, Murfreesboro Transit System. Um, got the name Murfreesboro in it, tells you that it's transit. Uh, next one is the same name, uh, just a different looking logo. And then uh, the last one is a different name. Uh, it has a little bit more pizzazz to it, if you will, uh, Borough City Transit. And um, uh, these two on the left kind of incorporate the Murfreesboro blue into it. The one on the right has some of the uh, existing green color in it. Uh, there is no dog, and uh, uh, there's no mascot whatsoever, but, but uh, uh, just a little bit bigger view of it here. Um, I'll put uh, all three of them back up there again. 
um, if you guys want to just kind of look at those for a, a minute or so. Um, is there any kind of questions that you have about these at the moment? I, I have one. Uh, to, so it's interesting to me. Um, I don't see any correlation or connectivity with that branding to our city branding that we have now. It seems different standalone. Was there a discussion about that? Was it intentional? Um, there was a discussion about it. The, if I recall, the, it wasn't that we uh, really needed to do that, to, that uh, we did want to have you know, something that did kind of stand out uh, on its own. But um, the fact that it has uh, the, that Murfreesboro blue color in, in it sort of you know, relates it to the city's current. You mean you mean brand? Do you mean branding of the existing system? No, I just no, I'm. Rover. You're talking about the city, the city's logo. Yeah, and that's where the the sticking to the city colors. And, yeah. And that that's really. Name. The Which one? The name, obviously, but. Which one's the city colors? The two colors different. I mean, the blue color is it's in our current logo. Um, it's a two on the left. Rover, Rover logo, but the city logo. Yeah, the, the other ones. The middle one and the one on the left. Those are the same as our city logo? No, it has same green. Color. Oh, color. Same color. Same I mean, color. Same color? Well, there's a, there's a, uh, uh, there's a shadow behind it, but the idea is that we would hit the same colors as the city blue. So this is just me, and it's probably my issue, but uh, I'm OCD about certain things that if you can't recognize them immediately, then you have to stop and think of what they are. So I wouldn't associate any of that with Murfreesboro. I realize it has Murfreesboro in the name, obviously, but when it can look the same and feel the same, I think it should. should. Outside of that, they're all fine or they're all terrible, whatever anybody wants to do. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I, Listen, I, I, would, I agree with that to a certain degree. I mean, I, I'll tell you a couple things, and this, for what it's worth, Colm, I don't care. You know, the colors aren't me. I don't like the borough city transit just I'm because I think that's either. too – that could be any city, and, and frankly, this probably does need, I, I would think it does need to be branded similar to the city rather than dissimilar. The MTS thing, the only thing that kind of worried me about that, the first thing that popped out of me was it's like MTSU without the U. I kind of was like, are there something, am I missing something? Then I had to read the small letter, you know, the words underneath it. If you got that on a bus passing by you, work to understand it. You're not going to be able to read the, the little part. I don't know. I'm. I don't want to get too granular here on something that maybe I should, but... So, can, can we not just use our existing city logo, and then if we, you know, if we just, everyone knows, they look at the rotunda, they know that's the city of Murfreesboro, there's, I don't know how many dang vehicles we've got driving in the city every day, but there's a bunch of them that people know what they are, so could we not incorporate that logo, and then if we want to call it, you know, whatever we want to, want to call it Murfreesboro, Transit system or well, whatever. Well, whatever has Murfreesboro in it, so yeah. you just put transit system, transit system up underneath, underneath it. it. Yeah, we could do that. Yeah. But yeah, I mean the idea here really is to get the base color, and then we can wrap to get over that. So yeah. I mean, the, yeah. the timing yeah. elements that's for the right. base color. So if we stick to the same. Yeah. If we stick to the city colors. I think we got what we need, and then we could we could bring back uh, next council meeting or something the logo with the rotunda in it. <coughs> Is that city logo staying around for a long time? Or is that in? I mean, I, it's. <laughs> that's a good question. That's, that's <laughs> I mean, it, put it on a budget. I, it's on police cars. It's on <clears throat> fire trucks. It's on all of all of our streets. water streets have that logo on the side. So I feel like we're probably pretty committed to that logo unless we want to rebrand the entire city. Yeah, we could use use the logo. For I mean, it's the, yeah, it's, so it's our it's, model, model it's, it's on our placards too. So I mean, that's <laughs> 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 so we can put transit system right. Stick it on there. So, so would you want to drop the the word system and just have it Murfreesboro Transit? I think if you got this right here, it says City of Murfreesboro, Tennessee, and then underneath that, tra transit system. Maybe something like that. I don't you know. It'd be pretty easy. Maybe it's too easy. You drop 
Too simple. You drop the Tennessee and just put transit system in. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. Perfect. One thing you could do, too, is just give the feedback to the artist and let the artist do what artists do and see what they come yeah, up with. Transit. Unless you're the artist in case. I'm sorry. I've, I've, <laughs> <laughs> so. Here's another concern I have, and this is, again, for just the little writing. MTS, is that not the initials for National Transit? Is it in a metro transit system? No. They, they were um, Metro Transit Authority, and they changed to WeGo. We okay. Five years ago. Yeah. Or was there any reason why it's Rover and it's some, you know, dog or... Yeah, so we, we did that. I don't think anyone... Feedback. Yeah, it went through a um, a naming. Little girl. Yeah, we, we sent that out to schools and uh, we and it, uh, Robert. I can't remember what Robert's name was. Bob Nugent. Bob Nugent. Yeah, he was the first director, and it went through. Uh, it went through basically a contest for people to see if they could child, na yeah, name the name the rover system so it was a little girl that yeah and, and I, my granddaughter of one of my staff employees yeah. came up with the name and i don't think we at that time we were getting into the transit system for the first time and i don't think we were i mean we really didn't know what we were doing just to be honest and then we didn't expect it to, to end up as big as what it ended up and then at the same time we didn't expect that to turn into a department that also dealt with all the different things that they're dealing with, not necessarily including Rover. So it just it just grew. But all right, does anybody have any other questions? That's, those those are great ideas. All right, so we'll we'll go with the current city colors as far as what we need to know for the buses, and then rework on the logo then. So, all right. All right. Um, does anyone have any questions for Aaron on the Feb February dashboard? All right. Seeing none, um, you, we have one beer permit. Thank you, Aaron. I got some other business to do. Mayor, we have um, Association has presented several dates for fundraisers and um, their application is in order, so if you approve this, we'll go ahead and issue these so they'll have them on hand when their dates come up. Any questions? I'll move. Have, second. A, have a motion and a second. Ms. Wright, please call the roll. Uh, Mayor Skills Harris? Aye. Mr. Lalance? Aye. Mr. Shacklett? Aye. Mr. Way? Aye. Mr. Wright? Aye. Mayor McFarland? Aye. Nate, uh, I think Nate has some staff business. Yes, Mayor, thank you. Uh, I'm sorry that this is coming to you so late. Uh, we just got a proposal last night. We're in the phase one of the Seagull Soccer Complex uh, conversion from artificial to, I'm sorry, natural to artificial fields. Uh, we anticipated that we might have some soil issues uh, out there based on what we've dealt with in the past. Uh, fields one and two were fine. We didn't have any pumping soils. As we got into field three, we realized about a third of that field uh, needs to be uh, cut and filled, and that's addressed in the contract that we have with them. Uh, we got the proposal just last night, so I thank Adam and his staff for getting us uh, the contract turned around so quickly. It won't hurt my feelings. I know it's late in the game. I know it won't hurt my feelings if you want to push this back, but uh, we're bringing it today just to, in an effort to keep construction moving. Uh, we're stalled until we can do something. They can start working on it theoretically uh, this afternoon or tomorrow if we can get every, all the signatures. So this is $120,000. Uh, the, the funds are allocated in CIP. It's a not to exceed number. Uh, what we anticipate is a much less number, uh, hopefully around eighty thousand dollars. But we just don't know until we dig out all of the soils. Uh, we do have a third party construction ma uh, manager who's monitoring that and agrees with the soil condition as well. Uh, and we're bringing this today, just like I said, an effort to continue uh, progress on the project. Um, I'll just add that. The per unit price was already set in the original contract. The piece of information that didn't have at the time that council approved the original contract was the volume. And given that it's so much in terms of volume, we thought it was important to bring it back to council. Any questions? Nate, we can't move forward without approving it, correct? Uh, yeah, Councilman, we're, we're stuck. We can't, uh, the project can't continue at all, and it's not something that we can't not do either. Uh, the soils would just lead to long-term issues if we proceeded. So, like I said, we, um, we anticipated it, but we couldn't quantify that. We did some core testing, and we knew we were going to have some, but it's hard until you start really digging it out. We dug test pits. We dug, I think, uh, four six-foot test pits 
on the site uh, just last week I was trying to figure out how much and this is the estimation like I said this is this is a worst case scenario um, number that we have but it's all we have to go until we pull it all out I'll make a motion to approve second motion and second Ms. Wright please call the roll Vice Mayor Scales Harris aye Mr. Lillian aye Mr. Barton aye Mr. Shacklett aye Mr. Wade aye Mr. Wright aye Farmer aye any other business from staff any other business from council? Something I want to bring up um, relative to the discussions we've had going on in the West Park. We can keep this pretty short and sweet today. We've had a long meeting already. Um, but in the planning commission meeting a week or so ago, um, someone who works for the county and used to be a commissioner in that area of the county got up and spoke. Sean Ronnie, I think, was in there, was there too. Um, and there were some comments made, uh, basically, that there were, he had somebody lined up that would come in and build the park for free and build all the fields and run it. Um, it you know, it started a little train of thought in my mind, and here's, here's part of where I'm at on this and just kind of run this by the council. I mean, look, if the county wants to participate, I welcome a proposal. And, you know, the fact of the matter is that's right on the county line. I've been getting a lot of phone calls from people who live in the county and emails who live in the county who say they deserve and were promised a park by the city. So what I'm saying is, you know, maybe we ought to ask. Let's see the proposal on building the fields. If you got somebody who's willing to build them for free, I'm open to look at it. I don't know what that entails. I assume they're wanting to rent it. I don't assume they're doing that for free so that we can all go use it for free. But if you're going to stand up at the planning commission meeting, uh, and presumably at other meetings, I, I'm open and, and you know, look, if, if, they, if the county wants to finally get in the parks business and help us out with half the cost, the, the, the ones of us that were on the council when we bought those two pieces of property out there to try to come up with options, I think we all sort of understood that the idea was we needed to get options in front of us and then try to make a smart decision. Um, we also understood that we looked for things that weren't so far away, <laughs> but it just didn't exist. Um, and we knew this was going to be a challenge. So, look, I guess I don't really know what I'm asked for. I don't know if it's a motion or, or who, who spearheads something like this, but if, if somebody's going to stand up there and say they got somebody that will build it for free, what I'm doing is opening the door and say, well, show us what you got. And let's see it. Um, you well, know, I, we've got a meeting April the 20th, maybe. This group that they're talking about is a group from Arizona that wants to come in and build a complex, but they are not. We, I met with them two weeks ago. They came to the office, and there was like 16 of them. They're doing a project in Arizona right now. I think is it Mesa, Arizona? Mesa, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. But they're um, they're not looking for 125 to 150 acres. They're looking for 200 to 300 acres. And and also, so we originally said, hey, we've got you know here there's here's acreage, and they were like, no, nah, that's just too small. Plus the other part too is so I mean, and I'm not indicating that we would have said, hey, build here. I mean, that's not that what we were we were saying but the other part too it's they're not looking to build something that they're going to let city residents or county residents use for free it's a for-profit business so it would be for um rent rentals e-gaming and other stuff like that it is not for a community park um, also, to clarify, I, I wasn't going to make any assumptions based on what he stood up there and said. <laughs> and so what I would say is, in either case, it got my mind started on this progression, this thought progression yeah. of whether it's show us the proposal on what you're talking about building stuff for free or let's talk about partnering on, on whatever we do out there because at the end of the day, it's probably going to serve people in the county. And we're certainly getting enough feedback. I am. I guess I seem from a nod, yeah. nodding of heads. Yeah. Everybody's getting some. I mean, I've heard from people in the county that high-paying jobs aren't important, that we promised and guaranteed a park. I mean, you know. And so if the county wants to get involved, I'm opening the door. And, and if anybody else, I don't know how we do that, but other than publicly say, and I'm saying it, and if you guys agree, then, then let's see if they want to get involved or not. 
if y'all would like, we can set a meeting to go. Um, you know, we did this. Nate, how long ago was it that we built 04 Park Tennis Facility? It was Mayor, under Mayor Burgess that we did that, but they had a very uh, significant issue where their high schools didn't have tennis courts. So we partnered with them and we built 04 Tennis Park. We paid half of it, they paid half of it, but we maintained it. So it's a great deal for the county because the, the city taxpayer is subsidizing from here on out. So. I don't mind if y'all, I think I had that that initial discussion with Mayor Burgess. If you want Craig and I to, and Nate or Angela to go meet with them and ask them if they want to go partners on not only we're looking at the 96 part, which is predominantly county, or and also if the 840 site that we're also talking about park, we can go gauge their interest on participation if y'all would like us to do that. That'd be good. They might talk about moving that payroll office out there and building a building out there rather than putting it on the square, too. That could be good. Yeah, the, pro, the probation no, office? Per, yeah, probation office. That's a payroll. Yeah. Have that discussion. I mean, we, we gave the county how many acres? Craig? Thank you. Uh, we, it's <laughs> several you. acres, but it's right now it's just limited to what they're building. So it's just and the so building site right now. The council now. voted a couple years ago to give them acreage out on Blackman or Blazing Fortress for a dollar. So we can... We'll march along and report back to you. Um, I got one other. Sure. I, 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 good with that, guys. We're ready. Sure. Um, the, the other thing is too that, that um, I've had a discussion, a couple of discussions with Darren over the last, I don't know, number of weeks, and something's come up with one with a uh, an item that came through planning commission and then council, um, and it, it really, I mean, it kind of there's a several different ways this to go, and I I just want to get the councils kind of idea as far as what the best way to try to deal with this or not deal with it. I, I you know, I, I feel like it needs to be dealt with, but, you know, one of a, a big development came through recently. It's not going to be no surprise who it is. It was an MU zoning that was in the GDO. Um, it's, it did spur on some thoughts to me as far as, you know, how our current ordinance is written, and it's a, it, could, it could be addressed in a couple of different ways. The basic idea was I didn't realize that when you overlap the GDO and the CCO and those overlays, um, I, I did realize that, that we excluded those from the sewer allocation ordinance, but I didn't realize that it did give substantially more density. I knew it was more density than just the bulk zoning, but I didn't realize that that superseded that. And so what, what we ended up with, just for an easy example here, I thought that when we did that 25% mixed use ordinance, that that equated out to 16 units per acre. You know, whatever you carve off, you carve off 25% of the property that's in MU, and you multiply that times 16 units an acre, and that's the amount of multifamily that you could get. Well, through this process, I learned well that's not really right. You can get 25 units per acre since it's in an overlay district. Okay. So that's kind of one set of the issue. I've also noticed since, you know, even just here very recently, there's been two or three more projects that have come through the CCO, and the densities have been pretty high. And so what I'm struggling with is sort of this idea that, that we have kind of this really, really high cap, or no cap at all, in those overlays versus we've pressed down the sewer allocation numbers to a pretty small number everywhere else. And so there's a couple of ways that in my mind we sort of come to the middle on that to determine, you know, well, we, we may want to address that so that if, you know, look, if you still you come in with a plan development or something like that, you still can ask for whatever you're going to ask for. I mean, that's, that's how it works. But in a bulk zone, Perhaps what we do is limit the, you know, there's one way to address it. Let's just stay through the sewer allocation, for example, which would say, and I've talked through this with Darren a little bit, try to get some pros and cons over the last few weeks, but, you know, maybe say, well, those CCOs and GDOs, instead of being completely exempt, that maybe they get twice as much sewer allocation, because we've all acknowledged that those are areas where we want more density and need more density and, okay, you know, more growth, all that's, and I agree with that. It's just that how much, those really extreme examples is really what always weighs on me a little bit and, my, you know, kind of in the way I think through these things. And so I just thought, well, okay, what if we just say, okay, you get twice as much automatically 
if, if we did it through the sewer allocation ordinance, we go in there and adjust the sewer allocation ordinance. Now again, this is just my opinion, my idea, and something for y'all to think about, not to vote on today. Um, you know, do it through the sewer allocation, maybe do it twice as much as the, what the normal sewer allocation offers instead of a, an exemption. Or we go to the mixed use ordinance and, and you know, or, or the GDO or some of the, you know, the other actual zoning ordinance and say, well, hey, look, do we want 25 units an acre? Do we want, you know, X amount in these different areas? I mean, I've seen a few things come through planning already and maybe one or two of them have already hit this, the council. You know, they're kind of the 30 units per acre kind of things and they're in the CCO and because the exemption, and I just kind of makes, always gives me a little anxiety because as we do have basins, but we also do have a one big whole number of capacity for the city that we can deal with. And the higher we go with those, y'all know, y'all heard me say this, you know, I mean, it's just math. And that's why I get anxiety about the stuff out on Thompson Lane, for example, because there is one big number that we got to adhere to somehow. So try to make it as fast as I could. But I, if y'all just say, no, I don't, want, I don't care about that, just say you don't care about it and I'll move on with it. I just felt like maybe we could deal with this some way and, and I thought maybe we sh it was something that I felt like was important enough for the council to address and say, well, we let Darren go to work on it or Craig or whoever to kind of build us some ideas on what we might do to achieve some of these things and then we can all say yes or no. Anybody? I, and I, I'll jump in. Um, I think, it, I think this is another good retreat topic because I think there's a lot of good dialogue that come, could come out of it. But um, I, I have some concerns about kind of the fairness and equity of how we've approached this and us pulling back entitlement based on sewer capacity and then us continuing to adjust that based on what we think is appropriate, right? Well, in listening to Darren talking through some of those things and really paying attention, you know, the sewer plant was upgraded in 2017. That's when it was upgraded. So we started talking about uh, capacity in 19 is when we started talking about it, two years after the last sewer upgrade. Um, and looking at the presentation Darren gave a few weeks ago, a few months ago, you know, we talked about, hey, it may not be as bad as we think it is, but I know that there are other driving forces behind what we're trying to do as we kind of sculpt and, and shape the city in the way we want it to develop out. And I think those are good things. But as we continue to claw back on certain entitlements that we put in place, I have a really uncomfortable feeling with that. But the other piece, too, you think about the conversation we're having about Blackman Park. Well, I think that's a really tough thing to think about when you think about how intense of a sewer use and density it would be as a park. And we're saying we think it makes a lot of sense to be office and we think it's going to bring white collar jobs and we're talking about investing that capacity out there. I can see us making some really convenient arguments based on what we want, what we think we want. And so I'm, I'm struggling with that. So I'm happy for it to be a retreat topic and us talk more about it, but just kind of off the cuff, I'm struggling with it. Yeah, I, look, and, I, and I'll say this to you too. I mean, anything that we have finite resources for yep. whether it be sewer or roads or whatever land mass you know I think that we are in charge of what the vision of this city looks like 10 or 15 or 20 years from now it, I'm not for just going in and taking away a bunch of entitlements from people either you know I get that we all we all voted to restrict use on MU to 25% yep. yep. we all everyone sitting here voted on that I'm pretty sure. And so we, we did start that process. I just didn't fully understand the way that the, the overlay, you know, associated with that at the time. I learned through the process of the last development that, tried, that, that came through. And so I'm just trying to address it now. I, 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 what I would ask for if I was going to, you know, what I guess I'm asking for today is for staff to look at some ways to think through this, to think what might make the most sense. The sewer allocation, look, at the end of the day, we've been, we've been telling people no a long time because of sewer. It hadn't been the people that are building some things. It's just been the people who've been bringing other things that we've been saying no to for a long time without that being a council decision. So frankly, in my opinion, 
the council has been more involved in that, which is the way it should be. We're the ones that are elected to make those decisions, to, to, to have that vision of, well, this is what, if we use up very much of our capacity in this way, and I look, I don't mind saying, I'll take some pain for bringing in a bunch of $100,000 a year jobs. Well, I give up some high-density apartments, for example, 25-unit acre apartment complex in order to bring in a bunch of $100,000 a year jobs. Yeah, I trade that. Just my personal, and, and I don't want, again, I don't want to do that. Let, let me clarify, I think, um, you know, most of this, and depending on how we do it, would be dealing with, would be dealing with new zonings, but the, if we do it by going in and adjusting, for example, the MU ordinance, it would have this set of circumstances where somebody might lose something that they think they have, okay? I don't know how many, I think something that would be helpful in the process, how many MUB pieces of property do we have in this city? I it's think it's only like, the GDO, right? It's only it's the like, gateway. Well, I, yeah, and there's it, only like four, I think. Craig, I, way, but. There, Craig, I see Sam shaking. I mean, we, this needs to be a, an overall topic at the retreat. I mean, that density, you know, because we're, unless I'm missing, we, we've got the capacity, isn't it? It is not an issue. Discharge. It, I mean, it's two it's buckets. <laughs> but yes, yeah, so, so, but hey, let, let's, before we get real deep into it, because we need to put that, I mean, I, I think you're right. Let's, we need to have that discussion because a lot, going through, you know, I, I was under the impression, hey, this is what you can get. And then when we were going through discussing that other one, it was like, no, this is really what you get. But, you know, we, well, let's, let's go through and, and clarify to make sure that we're all heading in the right direction. And, you know, to Ronnie's point too, we need to have the discussion on when that variance would be there, you know, like the, the park property. I mean, it, you know, is that, what, like what you're saying, that jobs, does that trump, now the intense use on office is way less than what multifamily would be, but I mean, I think if somebody brought in 100, 100, you know, 500 jobs and $100,000 a year, I even think there would be a density credit, you know, like, hey, we don't mind exceeding our density if you're guaranteeing you're bringing these jobs in, because sewer capacity is great, but if you don't have a job, you can't flush your toilet. I mean, you, you need jobs. So, is that cool that we do that at the retreat? Great for me. I just, hey, look, part of this too, guys, and just, I think y'all understand this. I've said it before. Hopefully, if we get this discussion and get it as right as we can get it in one big picture discussion, we don't have to have it at every flipping zoning project that comes through both the Planning Commission and the City Council that we've already said, this is what we expect. Expectations. You know, and once it comes in that way, we can say, we already told you. Well, don't, don't forget that we have, May 10th is the, isn't that the... 11th. Yeah, 10th and 11th. Mm -hmm. So if you've not sent, you know, I know they're taking notes on things that we're we're going to discuss, but if there are any other items that y'all feel like need to be on that agenda, that's the time that we need to to talk about that where we're not worried about, you know, what meetings come in. We're, we know that we're captive and we're sitting there. Cool. I, yes, I want to frame this in as simple way as I can. So really... The council has the ability to give anybody any density that they ask for. I think what you're saying is when do you want it to get to the council level? The MU zoning with its current density under the bulk zoning, even though it's maybe two or four properties, has the ability to get a high density dwelling unit count just through the planning commission. It would not come to council. Any plan development comes to you all in the the PCD, PUD, PRD, it's if you want to have a trigger for bulk zoning when it, in, a, in an overlay district, when, does it, when do you all want it to come to you for your approval? That's really, I think, the question on the table. You can grant whomever. You, I think what I'm hearing is you just don't want certain projects to be able to go straight through Planning Commission without your guys' uh, review and approval. That's, that's part of what he and I had discussed, and I probably didn't articulate that very well now that you, you say that, is just the idea of saying, look, we're not saying you can't ever get this, but saying, you know, 
under a bulk zoning, if you're going to be, for example, more than twice as high as the, the allocation ordinance, that's got to come to us. And we, we all have to put our own little hats on and say whether or not we think that's worth it for that use or it's not worth it right. for that use, right? And then and we can say, no, you don't. If four of us say, no, it's not, we don't think it's worth it, then it's not. If we do, then it's it. And I'd be okay with that on anything we talk about moving forward. The problem is we put the ordinance in place specifically excluding those places, the city core overlay and, and the GDO from it. Yeah, I, all I'm saying is I, I think they're probably, that was probably a mistake. I mean, so should that be the property owners? Years, that, well, be, if, if somebody's bought something in the last year since then, and they think they have an expectation, maybe, but I, it wouldn't be any different than if we had done it two years ago, if we did it, did it that way two years ago. I, I hear you. I just think we might feel differently if it belonged to us. I, I, look, I want to be sensitive to that. I, here, here's what I'm saying. I want to be. I want to try to figure out the best way. I don't have all the answers to it right now. All I know is that my spidey senses tell me that somehow some, you know, unlimited amount just for those folks doesn't jihaw for everybody else. I mean, how fair is it that everybody else doesn't get to incorporate that, right? I mean, we, we've made decisions that do impact people in this, landowners in this town. Let's save it for the retreat, because I don't yes. want to keep coming back and forth with it. That's cool. Yeah, that's good with me, man. I'm, I'm totally Cancel. good with that. And, yeah, I'm good with it. All right. Thanks for listening. All right. Agenda item. We're not meeting this Thursday night. Um, Tomorrow, yeah, we're not meeting. Or, Tomorrow. Tomorrow. This yeah. Thursday night, we're not meeting. A typical lawyer, correct? <laughs> no, I, I was supplementing it. I was okay. just. <laughs> hey, I'll see y'all later. Thanks, everybody.